Good morning, we are live from River Valley Room at City Hall. Uh, good morning and welcome to the October 26 Executive Committee meeting. Uh, Mayor Sohi will be joining us later in the day, uh, but I'm pleased to get us uh, started off. I'd like to start by taking a moment to reflect on the space uh, where we are and uh, undertake our land acknowledgement. So we meet on the traditional lands of Treaty 6 territory and want to take a moment to acknowledge the diverse Indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, such as Cree, Dene, Soto, Blackfoot, Nakota Sioux, as well as Métis and Inuit, and now settlers from around the world. I'll start now with a roll call of committee members. Uh, Councillor Rice is here in, not chambers, the meeting room with me. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Uh, Councillor Knack. Good morning. Oh, you're quite quiet there, Councillor Knack. We'll check the audio. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. We might circle back to do a test, but uh, uh, Councillor Rutherford, are you there? Okay, you're also quite quiet, so we'll work on that in the background. In the meantime, I'll just welcome our other council colleagues, uh, Councillor Wright. Good morning. Uh, uh, Councillor Paquette. Good morning. Good morning. Um, uh, Councillor Principe. Good morning. Good morning, Councillor Tang. Good morning. Good morning, and Councillor Cartmel. Good morning. Oh. We can hear you now, uh, folks online. Uh, could I just get Karen, uh, Councillor Tang, would you mind just testing your audio again for us just to make sure that's worked? For can you hear me? Perfect, great. Uh, we are all set to go. Uh, I'll look for someone to move adoption of the agenda, please. Councillor Rice. So uh, I move the October 26, 2022 Executive Committee meeting agenda be adopted with the following change. Uh, addition 9.2 GF Centers House and Board and the candidate interviews and appointments recommendations. Uh, replacement attachment 9.2 GF Centers House and Board candidates interviews and appointments recommendations. Thank you. Uh, please vote. I'm a yes. Thank you, we have all the votes. Please display the votes. And that's carried, thank you. Uh, Councillor Knack, would you be willing to move our minutes? Absolutely, thank you. I will move the approval of the October 12th, 2022 Executive Committee meeting minutes. Great, any additions or amendments? No, I'll call the vote then, please. Waiting on one vote. We have all the votes. Please display the votes. And that's carried. I'm not aware of any protocol items. So I'll move now uh, for select, selecting items for debate. If my colleagues would like to uh, click on. Councillor Rutherford. Yes, I would like to select item 6.1. 6.2, 7.8, and 9.1. Thank you very much. Um, I'll wait for others to click on, but I will select 9.2, uh, which will be time specific at 345. Um, Councillor Knack. Uh, thank you very much. I believe I'll be selecting 7-1 and 7-2. I think they're cross-referenced. Excellent. Thank you. Well, I'm not seeing any other names on the board. 
so last call for selection, but otherwise I will move uh, the remainder of the items. So item 73, 74, 75, 76, and 77. Um, and with no further discussion, we'll call the vote on passing those items. We're just getting the vote loaded. Sorry, I guess I'll vote yes. It's not popping up for me. Thank you, Councillor Nack. We have all the votes. Thank you. Please display the votes. And that's carried. Uh, Mr. Clerk, would you mind reading back the, what we've done this morning? Absolutely. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. This morning, Executive Committee has follow, uh, passed the following public reports without debate. Item 7.3, Allison Transmission Sole Source Approval. Item 7.4, Bylaw 20241 to designate the Stone House as a Municipal Historic Resource. Item 7.5, Bylaw 20242 to designate the Summer Kitchen as a Municipal Historic Resource. Item 7.6, Bylaw 20250 to designate the Fig Residence as a Municipal Historic Resource. And Item 7.7, Bylaw 20251 to designate the Stein Residence as a Municipal Historic Resource. Excellent. Well, and thank you to the teams who worked on those reports. Uh, even though we didn't select them, um, I really appreciate the work done on those. I'll ask now, uh, potentially, Councillor Rice, would you like to um, move our request to speak? I believe we have speakers registered on item 7 1. Huh, yeah, your microphone is not turning on. Yes, I turned on here, but it's because you can see it's not working. Um, Councillor Rice, if you want to try the next microphone, we'll have Council Tech look at that. I have two, okay. Uh, so the executive com committee here from the following speakers in panels with, when appropriate. 7.1, rate transit and leisure access programs. So the first speaker is Tim Adams and a free, free, uh, free play for kids in person. So we have do we have like a team Adams here? Yeah. I think so, yep, there he is. Hello, Not welcome. Uh, so the big speakers, Sencia Pal Maria, Alberta Works Association for Research and Education. It's remote. Are you here with us now, Cynthia? Well, that's all right. We can move that we hear from these speakers and hopefully uh, Ms. Palmaria will, will join us soon. Uh, so I'll call the vote to hear from those speakers on item 7-1. Sorry, for some reason still not popping up, I'll vote yes. Thank you, Councillor Knack. We have all the votes. Uh, please display the votes. And that's carried. Thank you very much. And I see our other speaker has joined us. Hi, welcome. Um, we'll be moving now into, oh, and requests for time specific on agenda. We don't have any. Uh, no counselor inquiries uh, that I'm aware of. I'll just do a quick check for my colleagues, okay. Reports to be dealt with at the meeting. We scheduled reports, none. So we are into our first item, uh, 6.1. Councillor Rutherford, I believe you selected that. So I'll go to you first. Yes, thank you. And I'm gonna just start right off the hop with putting a motion on the floor. Uh, and the motion is that the October um, 26, 2022 Office of the City Re Clerk Report OCC 01350 be referred back to administration to revise bylaw 20304, City of Edmonton Warrant Boundaries and Council Compensation Bylaw Amendment Number 4 to delete boundary adjustment number 2 as shown in Attachment 7 and return to Council. Thank you, Council Rutherford. Would you like to give a brief introduction to your motion? Sure, should I wait for it to be displayed? That's, that's always a great idea. Thank you, that's just coming up now. Please bear with us while we get that loaded.
I'm, I'm happy to start discussing it. It was already sent to, to, to council colleagues in advance. So they can also refer to their email if they would like. It hasn't changed since then. Uh, so again, just, I think that the boundary change that that this refer back motion speaks to is specifically a boundary change between Ward O'Damon and Ward Anelnik. And that boundary change, while seemingly minor, uh, I would contend has some major implications, at least from my perspective. So uh, I'm kind of wanting to, I'm, I'm wanting to refer this back on really two main grounds. One is the representation perspective. Um, and so, for example, arguably one of the primary concerns I hear from residents uh, in especially Calder and Lauderdale is around CN Rail and the Yellowhead. And so changing this could potentially create a real or perceived representation issue with residents uh, not able to vote for the representative on pertinent issues to nearby residential neighborhoods. And I would also contend that it creates a disparity because the um, Dunvegan yard would still be in Ward and Olnick. So I would be able to represent Athlone and Dunvegan residents in a different way than I could Calder and Lauderdale. Uh, the issues that rep residents are facing are long-term and ongoing issues that the city has been facing. And at times the, there are tensions with jurisdictional authority. I recognize that. So while this seemingly small boundary change has the potential to have large scale impacts on representation, uh, it only actually makes one minor change to um, eliminate one Edmonton school division ballot from one voting station. So I, I would argue and contend that that is not a, just a big enough change to justify that loss in representation. I also feel that this is important from an equity perspective as Wardo Damon has unique and understandably high volumes of matters to deal with given the realities that come with representing the downtown core. From an equity perspective, adding to the workload of Wardo Damon when we know that there's a high volume of concerns related to this proposed boundary change creates further inequity in wards managing the workload. Uh, that's it and I'll happily take any questions from colleagues about this motion. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford, and thanks for that great introduction. Um, I, I have I have some questions and comments, but just want to to see if any of my other colleagues know. Um, well, thank you. I mean, I think I think you actually said it all, and I I really appreciate you, rep uh, uh, you know, noting noting some of the the challenges of the downtown uh, ward already in terms of the complexity of issues. And uh, again, that would be a concern for me as well. I echo that in terms of. Assuming some of that responsibility for the the complex uh, issues with the the CN rail yards that you've noted, um, I think you know there's also the consideration of the block shaped wards as well, which uh, you know significantly changes the the profile of the O'Damon ward. And I know that shape isn't everything, but uh, uh, I, I think Councillor Rutherford's further uh, rationale uh, is very clear and something that I support. So. Uh, maybe just does administration have any any comments that you wanted to share in regards to this motion again just to clarify it would be again not to minimize but but it would be the advantage would be one less ballot in one less station which again isn't nothing but just wanting to get your sense in terms of the the importance of it to administration's uh, work in the upcoming election I think um, after every election it's part of the policy that we go back and we do review and we re reflect um, what we've brought through I'd say are two fairly minor amendments um, and it is completely at council's discretion on how you want to if at all adjust the boundaries um, for the upcoming election in 2025 great thank you well, I'm not seeing any any other further questions. So, in the in the interest of agenda management, I'm happy to move straight to a vote. Um, if uh, Councillor Rutherford, if you'd like to close again, I think I've I have shared my thoughts. Really appreciate you doing the work to bring this motion forward and uh, and support it for sure. But over to you. Yeah. If you'd like to close. Yeah, I just I will be very brief. Just again, I think the question that. I would hope my colleagues ask themselves is do the benefits of this change, which is one ballot from one voting station outweigh some of the consequences and challenges and misalign with our policy, which talks about specifically the importance of representation uh, within, within our policy uh, with these two words when we're facing uh, ongoing concerns with nearby residents. And my answer to that is no, and I hope my colleagues can understand and defer to the, the 
the counselor that represents this ward to to understand really the issues that it's facing and and the significant impact this could have on representation. So thank you very much. With that, I I uh, I close. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Uh, we'll call the vote, please. I mean, yes. Thank you, Councillor Knock. We have all the votes. Please display the votes. And that's carried. Thank you so much. Um, I'm delighted to take a moment to pause and recognize our guests from City Hall School. Uh, hello and welcome to Executive Committee. We're very pleased to have you here today. Oh, so this is the grade six class from Monsignor Fee Otterson School. Uh, so your representative, oh, and with their teacher, Susan Andre. I can't, oh, hello, hello, welcome. Oh, it's such a pleasure. And uh, you are represented by Councillor Jennifer Rice sitting here. Uh, so she is your city councillor for your school. Hello. Oh, we, sh we should clap. We always clap. Welcome. Welcome. Um, with that, we will move into item 6.2. Uh, so we have a motion on the floor. So that will be our starting point as we uh, get that loaded up. But uh, again, I believe this was selected by Councillor Rutherford, so happy to go to you first for some questions and, and comments on the motion that's on the floor. I, um, I have no questions or comments, but I know that we, we were in the middle of debate and ran out of time at the last one, so I felt like there was still some some, I, you know, as the mover, there's, there's no amendments. I know amendments were potentially discussed, but I am the mover of this, so cannot do that. So I would look to if uh, there's a desire from any other council colleagues to amend this and and uh, yeah, so that's why I selected it. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Um, any other members of committee or, or council who wish to weigh in on this motion before we take a vote? Councillor Rice. Um, so in terms of cer certain factors and, and for the mental health standards uh, from Canada, so I just want to um, ask uh, from culture sensitivity perspective, so how that culture sensitivities um, increase uh, the awareness for understanding and then to uh, acceptance uh, accepting and for the different ways to speak, different ways to thinking and different way uh, to express themselves. And then because that culture sensitivity sometimes really create uh, some misunderstanding or miscommunication uh, and in the workplace and how we can ensure and this factor uh, could be included and refracted and in these 13 factors and to ensure the physical, like psychologically health for that perspective. So I'm gonna ask Kelly Buckley, who's the Director of Respect in the Workplace and with us today to respond to your query, Councillor Rice. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Cultural sensitivity is a really important uh, component of a positive employee experience and creating an inclusive and safe city. So a number of the programs that come out of my section support employees in feeling both free to be themselves and to identify when they're having experiences that aren't positive. We have a number of ways that we can support employees in asking for support or seeking um, direction to address the concerns they're raising, including the Safe Disclosure Office, our Workplace Restoration Team, and certainly the Diversity and Inclusion Unit works very hard on developing resources and materials to educate employees on anti-racism, gender-based analysis, um, and ways that we can increase our diversity and inclusion. Recognizing that employees who experience issues related to cultural sensitivity may not always feel included. And so that's very important to us that we, we create many pathways for employees to address those safety issues. Uh, do we specific do we specifically have some programs addresses culture sensitivities 
And then I understand that we have that broad value and inclusion and diversity and apply and to the workplace. But any specific program yes. and the services? Yes, we have a training program called Diversity and Ourselves, which all employees are eligible to take. We have our respectful workplace training that does speak to cultural sensitivities and the differences in lived experience that different groups of employees bring to the workplace. And we have anti-racism training that specifically addresses some of the concerns um, related to that. Uh, that's great. And then even though we have the program and the services in place, I still heard and some voices and a specific concern about in the workplace uh, regarding the culture sensitivities created and then for the misunderstanding, miscommunication, and then don't feel comfortable, don't feel safe, and that actually impacts psychologically and for our employees and how that could be addressed again. Absolutely, and that is always a work in progress. We have opportunities that we've created for employees to share those experiences through our employee resource networks, um, through different uh, frameworks, the art of inclusion, the indigenous framework, and part of what inclusiveness means is creating both opportunities to educate employees and then to also create programs where they can share those concerns. So the Connected City program also supports employees that are dealing with um, uncivil experiences with the public as well. Okay, uh, thank you for that. My next question and then is about um, the standards apply to all management leaders or is there separate standards? And specifically, I would like to bring the points regarding this question is the managers, leaders, and all, are all human beings. So I want understanding these standards only apply to certain group or apply any level, including management and leaders. So the standard applies to all leaders across the organization as well as employees and we have specifically outlined in our um, commitment statement as well as the um, OHS standards, the responsibilities that uh, have at the different levels for leadership to protect both psychological and physical safety. Okay, I think that's uh, my two questions and thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Chair Stevenson, can I interrupt for a second? I have a process question, and forgive my ignorance about this. Um, I did consult with our uh, with DCM Stacy Padbury in regards to the motion and the fact that we don't have resources in place currently at the city to um, comply with the motion. So, the advice I got from DCM Padbury was that. Um, a service package would need to be prepared and or a budget motion. And I might be getting the language wrong on this, so forgive me, um, because, and sindel has got the specific details of the costs attached to the formal adoption, as well as quite a bit of additional detail, and it's two FTEs uh, would be required. So I just wanted to put that um, before you for awareness um, as you proceed with your um, with the proceedings this morning. Thank you, thanks very much. And maybe I'll just go to clerks in terms of advice around um, any changes that would need to be made to make the motion in order or is it uh, more having, you know, we could have a subsequent motion that, that speaks to the uh, unfunded service package. My advice would be that um, the motion could either be amended, um, it would stay as written, but with a comma at the end and then an unfunded service package be prepared to support the implementation um, of the standard. Perfect, well I, I would consider that a friendly amendment, um, but we'll look, look to my colleagues. So it would just be clarifying um, in this motion that uh, this would include, that the adoption of that would, would need to include a service package that would need to be uh, approved at budget. So I'm not, oh, is, is unfunded package? It would be an unfunded, yeah, for So it's just as part of this motion to add at the end? Yeah, I, I believe that's the suggestion, just be at the end. Can we so have word, wording first to look at? 
Absolutely, yeah, if we could get that up on the board. Absolutely, um, just bear with us. Thank you. So that should be coming up momentarily. Looks like it's just loading. Perfect. Um, so the motion would now read that the City of Edmonton officially adopt the National Standard of Canada for Psychological Health and Safety in the Workplace as a benchmark for continual improvement and report back to committee annually on progress. And then an unfunded service package be prepared to support the implementation of this standard for consideration by council in the 2023-2026 budget deliberation process. That was very well worded for something done on the fly. Thank you. Um, so I, um, I would suggest that this may be friendly, but, but happy, uh, happy to hear otherwise. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I have different view for this motion and because the first part motion and we are not talking about budget at all. And right now, if we add the budget, that is essential difference. Okay, yeah, well, it's an essential difference. If we add the budget package, and then, then we we should vote separately. And for the okay, well, that's that's very fair feedback. So, uh, apologies, but I will uh, we will remove that as a friendly. But I'm happy to move the the amendment that and that an unfunded service package be prepared to support the implementation of the standard for consideration by council in the 2023 2026 budget deliberation process uh, be added to the end of the motion. Thank you, and sorry, that might just take a moment to come up as well. Um, do, do any of my colleagues want to speak to the proposed amendment to the motion? Uh, Councillor Rutherford, I see you're already on the board. Was that uh, in relation to the proposed amendment? Yeah, I just have a question on it. I, I'm in support of it, but I'm just trying to understand, a pro it's a process question then. So, if um, if we if we add this as one motion, and let's say an unfunded package comes to the budget deliberation and is not funded, do we have to do a subsequent at budget to make sure that there's still annual report backs on psychological health and safety? Because that's to me a huge feedback loop and accountability mechanism that's built into the original motion that I don't want to lose. So I'm happy. I don't want this to not move forward but I also wanna make sure that I know if I need to do a subsequent following budget deliberations potentially. Oh, Councillor Rutherford, I'm not, um, we are absolutely not only happy to, but interested in continuing to come back on an annual basis to provide a comprehensive update on where we're at, not only in relation to the 13 factors, but also the factors that we identified earlier that are not in the 13, such as trauma-informed support. So I don't, you, from our perspective in the department, counselor, um, we will commit to doing so on an annual basis. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but I did want to in, um, offer that. No, I appreciate that. Uh, I appreciate that. I. I probably would still just want it, you know, there's, you know, it, it, if it's in writing, then then employees know that we care in a, in a different way than, than just that verbal commitment. So I just want to make sure that's not lost. So I, I, I'm absolutely appreciative. And, and I think we're on the same page of, of that. It's just, I, I do think it, I don't want it to get lost in terms of that, that direction from council. So I think that gives me the clarity I need. I support this amendment. I think that this is the good process to do and to look at any funding um, impacts or sorry, cost impacts of this motion in the totality of the budget. Great. Thank you so much, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Wright, did you wish to speak to the amendment? Not to the amendment, but I do have a question for administration. Okay, maybe Once we'll, we... yeah, thank you. We'll, we'll get through uh, the amendment first and then uh, we'll move back to questions. So um, I don't. I don't need to close. I. I won't speak to this. Did anyone else want to speak to the amendment? No. 
then I will call the vote, please. We have all the votes. Please display the votes. And that's carried. Thank you. So we'll, we'll get the amended uh, motion up on the floor and I'll go back to questions. So Councillor Rutherford, I think you were, you were up first. My question was related to, to the concerns about budgetary impact. So I, those have been addressed. I am good. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Wright. Hi, thank you. Um, I guess so then to administration, I'm, I'm just wondering about, about the, the benchmarking and, and comparison to other organizations. Would that be included in the progress reports? We are working on a mental health and healthy living framework that would, where available, look at other organizations who are uh, adopting this standard, the ISO standard we spoke about last time, and also um, the AMSA aspects of their optional element. Um, so we will provide whatever information we are able to um, in relation to that report. Okay. And any learnings from Absolutely. those as well? Okay. Thank you very much. That's all I had. Excellent. Well, I'm not seeing anyone else on the board. Um, so happy, happy to move to speaking. Um, I will, I will have a few things to say. Uh, Council Rutherford, I, I would imagine you may wish to close on this. Would any other uh, committee or council members like to speak to the motion before we vote? No, well, I will uh, jump in there. Any, and, and if someone else clicks in, you can certainly close after I do um, or speak to after I do. Yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, thank you so much for the, the conversations. Thanks to staff for preparing uh, the great report. You know, I'm really, I'm really excited uh, for this motion. I think that, you know, our, our people are the most important part of our organization. Um, and I think it's great to look at every tool we have to do the best, like, absolutely all we can to support their psychological safety. Because um, the lack or the absence of psychological safety poses a significant risk, not only for our employees, but for all Edmontonians who you know, may experience service decreases caused by absences or less than ideal service because people are dealing with their own stress. You know, this conversation has really made, me, made it clear to me that this team uh, at the city is committed to, to the psychological safety of our staff, which is wonderful, and I, I thank you for all the work that you do on a daily basis. And I think this is a really exciting opportunity for us to, you know, declare very strongly and loudly and definitively how much importance we put on this. Um, I appreciate that, that we will be having a conversation about resources as part of the budget, but I, I do feel two FTEs um, for, again, what, you know, 10,000 employees, at the, the heart, heart blood of our organization, I think is a very reasonable value proposition. But to this, not to preempt uh, budget deliberations, but again, thank you to the team for all the work that you do. Uh, and thank you to Councillor Rutherford for bringing this forward. Uh, Councillor Rice, I'll go to you uh, for, to speak. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Stevenson. Uh, I, I do want to um, emphasize another point and regarding the earlier question I asked. And because our workplace and no matter is the city or in the other workplace and across city and that multicultural and different background and the different ethics groups and work in our neighborhood. <laughs> neighborhood. I just visited neighborhood last night. I, I talk neighborhood uh, in our workplace, and specifically, and then if we really talk about inclusion and diversity, but how we ensure everybody and with different language background, with different culture background, come to the workplace and feel really feel uh, to be included and really feel comfortable to express themselves, and really feel, and even though their language is a sick, is their English is their second language, they can still can communicate in the way and they feel comfortable. So that is actually really creates a psychological safety and for the people with come different backgrounds, different culture, and different language and work in the workplace. And then, even though I heard it's great, our city, we have programs and services in place. And however, I still heard the voice and the complaints and the specific from, from our ethics group. 
and then people feel uncomfortable, people feel unsafe, and for their psychological and then health. And I really hope this uh, standards, uh, fully adapted standards, can uh, emphasize or enhance that type of program and services and for those type of groups. And that is one point I would like to say. And another point is uh, man management and leaders. And I would like to say um, management and leaders, no matter which position they are, they are human beings. They are human beings as well. And then the same, everybody are equal from that equi equity perspective. Everybody is equal, even though we are doing different different job and a different position, but we are equally we're human beings. We have emotions, we have our own thoughts, and we have own ways to how we work, how we express ourselves. I think these standards and then if we, from that equity perspective and really reflect that implementation as well. Uh, so looking forward and to uh, our city uh, Edmonton to fully adapt uh, the standards of Canada and for this psychological health and safety and then I'm um, um, support this motion as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. And uh, over to you, Councillor Rutherford to close. Yes, thank you. I, you know, my colleagues spoke so eloquently that I, I have very, very little to add, but I think, you know, the message that I want to say to, uh, City of Edmonton staff that are listening is that this council does care. And not only do we care, we have several council members that have had experience in city administration, including Councillor Stevenson, Councillor Tang, Councillor Hamilton, and myself, all of which have worked in city administration. And so while there's many things that we loved about our job, there's also areas that we know need improvement. And we've heard from our friends and colleagues that still work there that, uh, that there needs to be improvement and benchmarking is an essential piece of knowing where we are and where we need to go. Uh, not only as a total organization, but are there pockets of dysfunction or areas that need to be addressed within the organization. So I think that, you know, having this benchmark and this national standard that is well researched and well um, validated is really important in, in this piece. And while I recognize there is a budgetary imp implication and I make no pre presumption on, you know, what will end up being in or out of the operational budget. Um, I think that this is a step to at least make sure we're, we're considering this and giving this due consideration within the totality of the budget. So, uh, appreciate, uh, you know, consideration from my colleagues on this motion and with that, I'll close. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Uh, please vote. Just waiting on one vote. We have all the votes. Please display the votes. And that's carried. Thank you so much uh, again. Wonderful. Well, we are finished with our unfinished business and we'll be moving on to the cross-referenced items 7-1 and 7-2. Just give a moment for our, our delegation uh, to make their way to the front. Whenever you're ready. We'll just queue up the presentation here. Uh, good morning, uh, Madam Chairperson, committee members, members of council. Uh, today with me, uh, we have uh, Sarah Feldman, our Director of Business Integration and Workforce Development for Edmonton Transit. We also have uh, Roger Jevony uh, from uh, Community Recreation and Culture, and other members uh, of the team are uh, on the call as well to help answer questions today. Uh, today, uh, we'll be presenting two reports responding to council motions. 
These reports have been cross-referenced due to the overlapping themes related to how we support greater social equity through our approaches with transit fares as well as recreation programs access. These motions provided us with an opportunity to reflect on our programs and how we continue to identify and reduce barriers to access. This is just the beginning of this work and the work will continue. We will be engaging more voices and groups to help further uncover barriers and improve access for Edmontonians. Enabling mobility for low income Edmontonians is key to ensuring access to employment, education and services. Likewise, providing access to recreation programs supports community health and well-being. I'll now pass the presentation over to uh, Sarah to uh, continue with the details. Good morning. Uh, so we have uh, two reports uh, with several parts to the motions. So I will be first reviewing. Do I? Okay, so I'll go, I'll start with a quick recap of the two motions and then I'll go over the information for both reports together. Uh, the first report responds to this motion made at the March 14, 16, 2022 City Council meeting. The motion covers a range of topics and seeks information on use, cost and eligibility for the ride transit and leisure access programs and opportunities to expand these programs. The motion also asks about youth access to fare free transit and an analysis of access for individuals with long term disabilities. The second uh, motion, I don't think I can. The second uh, report uh, responds to a motion from Community and Public Services Committee on March 2021. There are two distinct parts to this motion. Uh, the first relates to the co-creation of equitable fine repayment options. And the second part asks for a review from an anti-racism perspective of our low income fare programs. So for the first part pertaining to repayment options, we are approaching this as an interim report. At the Community and Public Services Committee meeting just uh, so on September 9th, an update was provided on the Public Place Spaces Bylaw Review Project, which was initiated to review three bylaws pertaining to public spaces, the Public Spaces Bylaw, Parkland Bylaw, and Conduct of Transit Passengers Bylaw. This project will consolidate the three bylaws into one covering behavior in all public spaces. This includes a review to harmonize infractions and fine amounts between the bylaws. The report on September 9th also discussed three current council motions that ask administration to explore alternative methods to bylaw violation repayment that do not involve pay paying fines, such as restorative justice practices and other repayment options. So the responses to these motions are best to come forward as part of the bylaw review project. So as a result, our report today provides an update on the current state of fair fine repayment options and we will bring recommendations forward on alternative transit fine repayment options to council in coordination with the results of the public spaces bylaw review. So I will start with a general overview of all of the programs discussed in the two reports. The first motion speaks to ride transit and leisure access program. The leisure access program or LAP was launched in 1995 to provide Edmontonians experiencing low income access to participating city recreation facilities and attractions. The program provides a subsidized membership, either fully subsidized annual membership or a partially subsidized monthly pass based on a sliding scale model. And this program is fully funded by the city of Edmonton. Individuals approved for LAP annual membership receive unlimited admission to recreation and attraction facilities, a 75% discount on registered programs, access to drop-in child minding and access to some drop-in programs such as Shinny and Member Skate. The Ride Transit program launched in 2017 to provide greater access to transit for Edmontonians experiencing low income. It was identified as a key game changer in the Ed Poverty Edmonton Roadmap. The program provides subsidized adult and youth monthly passes to eligible Edmontonians and aligns with the transit fare policy by providing fare discounts to those who need it most. The transit fare policy was updated in 2019 with extensive input from Edmontonians and this led to the design and establishment of four key principles, including the principle of affordability. Council made an intentional choice to design a policy that valued transit service as a service that's partially offset by user fees while directing financial support to those who need it most. 
This was supported by what we heard from Edmontonians who said that investment in fare subsidies should focus on a needs-based approach. We have a variety of measures to keep transit affordable, including ride transit, providing accessible transit here or path, donate a ride, fare free for youth 12 and under, and fare free seniors for seniors experiencing low income. I'll now, uh, as a, related to the second part of the motion, provide uh, to improve access to and awareness of the city's low income fare programs. Uh, we engage the local external engagement and policy advisors who work with racialized communities to conduct the anti-racism review. But before we talk more about the review, I want to share a brief overview of the three low income fare programs. So as already mentioned, the Ride Transit program launched in 2017. Uh, in September of 2022, we had approximately 17,800 Edmontonians purchase a Ride Transit Pass. And this program is jointly funded by the City of Edmonton and the Government of Alberta. Donate a Ride program distributes single use transit tickets to local agencies who support individuals and families experiencing low income. The purpose is to provide short term urgent transportation to support those who need it. Uh, this program started as a community initiative but as in, 19, uh, in 1995, but has been fully funded by the City of Edmonton for the last several years. The program distributed 64,000 tickets to 70 agencies this year. And since its, its, its inception, the program has distributed more than $2 million worth of transit tickets. And then lastly, the Providing Accessible Transit Here or PATH program provides free monthly passes to social agencies who support unhoused or precariously housed Edmontonians. PATH evolved out of the Youth Transit Access Project in 2016. Initially, the program provided 100 monthly passes to youth serving agencies, but it has since then been expanded to support adults as well as youth. Currently, the program provides 1,900 passes each month based on the Homeward Trust houseless population count. Uh, the program operates on a relationship based model, so there's collaboration between the City of Edmonton and the partnering agencies. City staff meet with agency representatives each month to discuss the program and provide feedback. Donate a Ride and Path are both delivered in partnership between ETS and the Social Development Branch, with Social Development facilitating these relationships with agency partners. So now on the next slide, uh, the first motion asked us to share the use, cost and eligibility criteria for Ride Transit and LAP. So as you can see here, the use in growth programs has grown substantially over the last five years. Ride Transit participation has more than doubled, with 17,800 17,800 monthly passes purchased in September of this year, compared to 6,800 in September 2017. And we're now at the highest number of passes sold since the start of the pandemic. Uh, while the LAP program has operated for 27 years and has a well-established membership base, this has also grown over the past several years, growing, fr growing from 50.6 thousand in 2017 to 70 thousand uh, eligible members currently. On the next slide, we share a bit about the cost of the programs. Ride Transit and Leisure Access Program are ad in administered in an integrated manner. There is a single application for both programs, and eligibility is assessed by staff in community recreation and culture. Uh, the Edmonton Service Centre and the ETS Customer Programs team also support this process. Once a resident has a is approved for one program, they are eligible for the other, um, and they can obtain their monthly transit pass and recreation pass through various channels. Uh, there are currently 11.8 FTEs dedicated to administering the two programs with an annual personnel cost of 819,000. Personnel cost formu costs formulate the majority of the expenses for both programs. The annual expense budget for ride transit for 2022 was 26.4 million, and this includes the retail value of passes sold and program expenses such as personnel, materials and equipment, external services and other costs. The annual revenue budget was 13.4 million and this includes revenue received from riders purchasing their passes as well as the provincial grant revenue. And this results in a net position of 13.1 million for the program in this year, uh, which is the operating subsidy provided by the City of Edmonton. Uh, this next slide provides an overview of the eligibility criteria. Since launching Ride Transit and LAP, we have worked to increase access to the programs beyond the low income cutoff. The low income cutoff is determined by the federal government on before tax income. To increase access to these programs, we have been expanding the list of qualifying documents for eligibility. Uh, many of these changes were introduced as a result of previously, uh, previous feedback we've heard from council. 
in 2017, the eligibility for ride transit was primarily based on AISH or the low-income cutoff. And during this time, LAP was accepting a few other forms of government assistance as well. Um, LAP also had a sliding scale model which provided three levels of access depending on income levels. In 2018, ride transit income criteria expanded to 10% above the low-income cutoff and the list of, of qualifying eligibility documents expanded for both programs. So qualifying documents now include Government of Alberta Income Support, Learner Income Support, New Permanent Resident, Refugee Status, Child Under Government Care, and, and Employment Insurance, um, which was added for Ride Transit only. Uh, several of these qualifiers were already in place for LAP since 2006, including Disability Benefit, Permanent Resident Status, and Refugee Status. In 2019, we introduced a sliding scale model for ride transit program to align with the LAP program. So this introduced a 50% discount for individuals with incomes 10 to 25% above the low income cutoff. Then in 2020, due to trends we are seeing during the pandemic, uh, such as limited access to government services and photocopying, we extended the membership lengths for ride transit and LAP for those qualifying under AISH, under the low income cutoff, and children under government care. And then lastly, in May of this year, with the influx of Ukrainian refugees, we added the Canada-Ukraine authorization for emergency travel as proof of status for both ride transit and LAP. So on the next slide, uh, we continually review barriers for accessing both programs to ensure they are inclusive and meet the needs of the community. Several marketing and outreach initiatives have been planned to increase awareness of the programs. And we've also been participating in various community events to promote both programs. In terms of expansion to the, the programs to First Nations surrounding Edmonton, we met with representatives from Enoch Cree Nation, given our shared boundary and the memor memorandum of understanding uh, that exists between the two, uh, the two governments to explore different options for access to transit fare and recreation. While we initially uh, considered expanding ride transit and LAP el eligibility, we heard from Enoch leaders that people living on reserve are generally not seeking a monthly transit pass as their travel is infrequent and a discounted pass may still be financially inaccessible to them. Through the engagement with Enoch Cree Nation, we learned that the best way to suit their transit and recreation needs would be through approach similar to Donate a Ride, as well as participation in the group LAP and bulk discount programs for recreation. So we are continuing these conversations with Enoch leaders to evaluate these options and move forward to implementation. So the next slide speaks about youth access. As you may recall, one part of the motion, we were asked to explore the requirement for youth 12 and under to ride transit fare free without a fare paying passenger. In this motion, we were also asked to assess what it would look like to make transit free for youth 18 and under. Since 2018, youth 12 and under have been riding fare free with a fare paying rider. This was after council approved expanding the requirement from age five and under up to age 12 and under. This current policy is aligned with our regional partners participating uh, in our fare payment system, except for the city of Leduc and Leduc Transit, which sets the fare free age limit to five and under with a fare paying passenger. Uh, to encourage youth ridership, we currently have several streams of fare support for youth riders up to the age of 24, and this includes age-based and income-based discounts. The youth fare category was increased to the age of 24 and under in recognition of the fact that some youth over 18 do not attend post-secondary institutions that participate in the UPASS program. And for income-based supports, the Ride Transit program includes a youth category. So although allowing youth 12 and under and 18 and, and under, or 18 and under to ride fare free without a fare paying rider may increase the demand for transit and support the city's mobility and transportation mode shift goals, we have outlined some challenges in the report. Uh, both options could result in tran transit fare revenue loss, uh, present operational challenges, and increase some, passenger, some pressure on transit service. As I mentioned, our current policy is aligned with our regional partners. So if the policy is changed, we will work with the regional partners to align communication to riders and staff. Another consideration is there could be a sig significant increase for demand in school special routes. This would be challenging given our current constraints on fleet and maintenance facilities to support growth. Uh, there are also some operational aspects that need to be considered. Expanding the fare-free age limit to 18 years would be challenging for operators and transit peace officers to monitor and enforce. It's generally easier to visually identify youth 12 and under than it is to differentiate 18 and 19 year olds, and this could lead to some fare disputes between riders and operators. 
Regarding financial implications for allowing youth 12 and under to ride travel fare free requires some further analysis. Projecting the cost of this is difficult with our current data sources and requires some additional targeted rider research. However, we have determined that the, uh, expanding the fare free age limit to 18 uh, will result in fare revenue loss of approximately 20 million annually uh, based on the sales of youth passes through local school boards and other channels. If council wishes to implement fare free for 18 and under, this revenue impact would need to be funded. So as an alternative to this, we uh, recommend increasing support to youth riders, including more work with youth serving organization and education and outreach programs with the school boards. In addition, ETS is currently exploring more off-peak service to support youth riders and extracurricular youth activities. So lastly, I will talk about the anti-racism review in more detail. This review of low-income fare programs is important ongoing work for Edmonton Transit Service. This report is a check-in with you to bring you up to date on the work we've done so far and what we're planning to do moving forward. We know there are more vo voices to engage and more groups to support to share their perspectives about barriers we need to remove to enable greater access to these low-income fare programs. To get this process started, we engaged external resources who specialize in equity and anti-racism work. The focus of the work is to reduce barriers and address po program and policy gaps. We completed this in two steps over the last year, engaging local agencies and individuals who participate in these programs. Phase one was conducted by the Center for Race and Culture and involved focus groups with current program participants, focus groups with agency partners, and one-on-one -on -one interviews with ride transit riders. Phase two was conducted by a firm called Equity in Action. The intent with phase two was to report back our findings from phase one to the agencies who support these programs and engage with them in further discussion on how to address these barriers. One important aspect acknowledged in the final report is that by removing access, by improving access to transit service through these fare programs, we are supporting greater equitable participation in civic life and social and economic inclusion. Based on the anti-racism review findings, we developed an action plan to address the barriers and we'll be implementing this over the next year. Our steps include expanding on this review by assessing the initial findings and proposed actions and getting more input to, to identify further gaps that need to be addressed. And this is ongoing work and we'll need continual review and engagement. So just my, my last slide. Since 2018, we have made improvements to Ride Transit program based on the feedback we received during the program evaluation. Some of these changes include improving the readability and usability of the application form by simplifying some of the components. Uh, as I previously reviewed, we expanded the income qualification documents and expanded the, like, the low income cutoff eligibility. In 2020, we also added phone and online sales channels, as well as expanding the auto debit option to all ride transit participants, which eliminated the need to purchase the pass in person. Uh, we also increased marketing and outreach e efforts to increase program awareness by partnering with community organizations. Based on the findings of this recent anti-racism review, we learned about more opportunities where we can further reduce barriers by ma and make transit more accessible to Edmontonians with low income. So specifically for Ride Transit, the focus will be on enhancing the application process and addressing some program eligibility gaps for those with lack of documentation. This includes allowing agencies to submit a letter on behalf of clients in lieu of other documentation. This will allow interim access for individuals and families in transition until they're able to provide the required documentation. For example, sometimes people do not have a notice of assessment, such as youth who are aging out and are turning uh, 19 and no longer qualify in the family application, or women fleeing domestic abuse. For Donate a Ride and PATH, we're working on streamlining the agency reporting process to reduce administrative burden to the agencies. We're also looking at widening the fair product options available, particularly for Donate a Ride, and in improving awareness of these programs among agencies that serve all demographics. So regarding the 2023 plan, some notable changes include uh, launching an online application for both Ride Transit and LAP, uh, working with the PATH agencies to simplify the reporting process and reduce burden, Increasing the amount of fair product available for both PATH and Donate a Ride to reflect the increase in poverty rate to help agencies better meet demand. We'll also start having two application periods for Donate a Ride, one in, starting in Q1 and the other one mid-year, to allow agencies to better manage their in inventory and anticipate demand. We will start providing day passes under the Donate a Ride program rather than only single-use tickets. And we will also be looking into updating the eligibility criteria for Ride Transit 
so applicants will be able to obtain a letter of support from a community agency to confirm their program eligibility. We're also working on reintroducing with the Edmonton Service Centre a pre-screening service so that applicants can purchase their ride transit discounted monthly pass upon submitting their application rather than wait for their application to be reviewed. Uh, and lastly, but very critically, we will be enhancing program outreach and communication so that people and agencies who support them are aware of the programs and how to access. This includes updating all our communication materials and doing targeted outreach to agencies to increase their awareness of the three programs. Uh, so all of this does not mean our actions end here. This work is essential. It requires an iterative process of engagement and action. We will continue to have conversations with communities about how we can ensure equitable access and improve mobility for all the Edmontonians experiencing low income. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that presentation. I'll now invite our speakers to come up, our public speakers. So, uh, Mr. Adams, I know you're uh, with us in chambers today. And for uh, Ms. Uh, Palmaria, just a, a quick update. I know some of you have spoken before, uh, but we will be hearing from you in panels today. And each speaker will have five minutes to present. The clerk will run the official timer in council chamber. And the timer, on the timer lights on the podiums will be green for the first four minutes. Turn yellow when there is one minute remaining and flash red when the five minutes are up. Uh, if you are participating virtually, we will have something on screen, uh, but you may wish to use a timer of your own. So once you've both had a chance to present, uh, members of committee and council may ask you questions, so please, please stick around. And uh, if you are participating virtually, please just remember to keep yourself muted uh, when you're not speaking. Uh, and we, we will not uh, be using the, the raise hand function uh, as it creates issues of fairness and decorum. So with that, I will go to our first speaker, Mr. Adams, over to you. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm just here today to speak on behalf of Free Play for Kids and uh, other organizations who are trying to access city recreation facilities. If you don't know, Free Play has had a large elementary school age program, but in the last three years, we've started to grow our junior high and high school programs, and in 2023, we expect to service and support about 1,000 youth. And one of our main barriers is the access to, to those facilities and to get physically get there. Um, we've been having some extremely productive conversations and great work with city administration to make city uh, recreation centers free after school, so that barrier is being removed. Now we just need to get them there. And we've been having productive conversations to um, streamline that process to see if we can make it a bit easier for kids to get to the city recreation centers. And so I wanted to speak today about some opportunities. We're very much in support of seeing um, youth having the opportunity to have free service 18 and under. I know that comes with a cost though of $20 million and that's a big ask. Um, so we were proposing here a small short-term solution as a potential pilot that could be run. And you see up on the screen there, you can just scroll down to the part where it says the four existing routes to be made free. We're recommending that at minimum we start with four routes that already exist and just making them free after school between 3 o'clock and 7 p.m. These routes already exist. You see the, three, the four there, the number three, the number 101, the number 114, and the number 106. Um, and then there's two additional routes that we would need to create. But this is just a short-term solution to make sure that we can get kids to the recreation centers and to lots of the programs that we've started through the Youth After School Initiative and the city's take some great leadership on creating the $15 youth pass so kids can get to the rec centers and use it for $15, which is incredible. And this just helps get them there. So these four routes here, it's simply a matter of saying between 3 and 7 p.m., anyone under the age of 18, you can get on for free and get to the recreation center and get to the services that you need. The two additional routes where you see there, um, number 108 and number 116 are other quick win routes that could create a great amount of access to Clairview Recreation Center in the Northeast. And then finally there where you see the two new routes need to be created, there's new route number one. There's currently a challenge with the Youth After School Initiative where there isn't, as we all know, isn't a lot of um, facility recreational space in the west of Edmonton. And so um, right now, uh, uh, Sane FX, uh, Bill Hunter Arena, Jasper Place Fitness Center isn't under the Youth After School Initiative and hopefully it will be soon. But there's a deficit, so we need to get kids in that region of the city to Twilliger and there's no active bus route. So we've looked at creating a route that basically goes from Britannia Junior High past Jasper Place and St. FX and to Riverbend Junior High School to Twilliger and then back again. And then there's another route that we've talked about in the southeast where there's also a challenge of getting to Meadows Recreation Center. 
Uh, the way the city was designed, it goes up and down and up and down, the roads go up and down. And it takes a youth a very long time to get to Meadows Recreation Center, but we found a shortcut. And so if you see route number two there, if you click through the links, you start to see that that route will get kids to Meadows Recreation Center quickly after school. There it is on your screen there from Edith Rogers right to Meadows Recreation Center. So we're looking at some efficiencies. If you scroll down, we've done some estimated costs working great with the folks from Edmonton Transit just to come up with some ballpark numbers. Um, we talked about those four routes where we're just asking them to turn over and be free. Um, essentially, there's maybe 40 kids a day on each bus. If you buy a, a pack of 10 tickets at $20, that's $2 per kid. So the estimate of lost of potential revenue, $80 per bus times four buses. We're in for maybe $51,000 for a school year to get all those kids from all those four school routes to the recreation centers. And we layer in the extra two and then the new routes. And you see the total cost there being around $258,000. But that doesn't uh, talk about optimizing the buses. So the bus could, uh, after it's done the run, to drop the kids off at the rec center, go do another run, come back, and then drive the kids back from the rec center. They can also springboard on to not deadhead. So after finishing the routes for after school and the rec center routes, it could go do another route so we can optimize that bus. So for a very minimal cost, in my view, it's not a $20 million cost, it's a much smaller cost. We could potentially get 60,000 youth to our city rec, rec centers and using that space well and accessing all the partner services. Uh, and it would be really exciting and this is a great opportunity to build on the great work that um, council has provided and city administration have provided of making recreation centers free. And, as we know, it's not just about kicking a ball or bouncing a ball, it's about the partnership and the mentorship and the social support and the connections that you can make when you're there. So um, yeah, this is just my opportunity to hopefully advocate for the youth to have an opportunity to get to our rec centers and make some friends and get to play. Great, thank you so much, Mr. Adams, uh, for your presentation and for the work that you're doing in our community. I'll go now to our uh, second speaker, Ms. Uh, Palmeria. Uh, the floor is yours for the next five minutes. Good morning, councillors and everyone, and thank you for this opportunity to uh, let us speak. Uh, my name is Cynthia Palmaria from uh, Migrante Alberta, an advocacy group um, for uh, Filipino workers, and uh, we work closely also with another organization called AWARE, uh, Alberta Workers Association for Research and Education. Um, so we are the only organizations in Edmonton that fully support undocumented families. And access to city services has always been an issue for these undocumented families. So one example is the low income bus passes program, which cannot be easily accessed because uh, for one, individuals must provide identification. And these undocumented families are often very scared to give doc uh, to give doc, um, to give governments their name and personal information as they do not know if they can trust if the information can be accessed by uh, the CBSA or the Canadian Border Service Agency. Um, also to access the, uh, the low income bus pass, individuals must provide proof of filing their taxes. So some undocumented families can provide this information while others cannot. And it depends on how they entered Canada and if they have a valid social insurance number. Many of these undocumented migrants, if not all, came in as temporary foreign workers with proper documentation. But for one reason or another, um, they have lost their status, but they did not jump the border or any queue. So, we are currently working with the city administration to develop a pilot project that will allow bus passes to be given to our organizations so that we can distribute them to families in need at the low income price of $35. So we're very excited about this project and have, uh, have had a very positive relationship with the city staff. Uh, the city council in 2018 did pass an access to municipal services uh, without fear policy, so access without fear. And so this project will ensure that the access without fear policy is being act acted upon. Um, 
as uh, organizations, AWARE and Migrante are here to raise awareness about the project and the issues facing undocumented families here in Edmonton. We also would like to state the importance of allowing children and under 18, under 12 to remain free on transit and if possible, without an accompanied fare paying individual. There are many families uh, without immigration status who send their children to school, but will not use the school bus system because they are too scared to let the school know of their home address. This is because CBSA have targeted schools to provide registration records to find families for deportation. So many children and families rely on the regular transit system to get to school. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thanks for uh, joining us and sharing those, those really important insights. Excellent, well, I'll turn now to my colleagues for any questions that they may have of our speakers. Um, those were two very clear presentations though, so I don't know if there will be any, any questions. Um, I'll see if any of my committee colleagues, I think Councillor Rice is clicking in, so I'll go to you first, thank you. Uh, thank you for taking time and for public speakers to come here to bring very important issues to the city. And specifically the first, uh, Ms. Adams. And so do you have a specific population number and for how many kids and youth in your presentation talk about after school uh, going to the recreation center? Uh, yeah, right now we are sending uh, upwards of about 150 per day to four different recreation centers, Commonwealth, Terwilliger, Clareview, and Meadows. We also use a few of the city arenas, um, but that's growing to the point where there will be about 1,000 kids per day going to the different recreation centers after school, ages 13 to 18. Uh, 13 to 18. Correct. So from that, from just a very practical, pers uh, practical perspective, mm -hmm. uh, all those kids uh, go to recreation center directly from the school location or they come to the certain central location and they go from there and to the recreation center? They go straight from school to the recreation center. So a lot of the time what we've been doing of the past, especially with um, the challenges with the pandemic is we provide private busing. So we rent school buses and those school buses will do pickups and take the kids from the school to the recreation center. And if specifically for the kids under 12, mm -hmm. do we have a supervision and, and go with them together and then, or just as they take bus, or like you mentioned, take school bus, and if you yes. rent a school bus, and right now, so you are seeking the different solution and for them to. Correct, yeah, so the our youth for our program ages eight to 12, We've started working really proactively with the Edmonton Public and Edley Catholic School Boards where we now program out of their schools. So youth ages eight to 12, grades three to six, they stay in their school. Um, we, we program in their school, in their school gym, at their school grounds after school from three till 6 p.m. And we transport them one day a week where they come together and have sort of multi-sport festivals and get to participate together. And that's staffed and we staff it and we use private buses to get those youth there ages eight to 12. The ages 13 to 18 is a bit different because we're relying on them to get to the rec centers on their own, often with yeah. mentorship and support for the first couple of times, but then they take transit themselves or we use a private bus. Uh, do you have a different number and between the under 12 and the 13 to 18? Yeah, there's more in the under 12 age. We partner with 24 elementary schools and junior, uh, excuse me, elementary schools in the ages eight to 12 and there's 30 kids per school. So there's about a thousand there. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, thank you, that's, that's my Is that clear enough for question. you? Sorry, did that make sense? Uh, uh, I, I just tried to do some mathematics and okay. to have a question to ask at me. Okay. At okay. State Administration. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Rice. Um, I'll go to Councillor Tang now. Great, thank you very much. Um, Councillor Stevenson, and thank you to everyone who came out uh, to speak. I have to say, um, I'm very appreciative that both of your 
presentations, not only did you, you didn't just, you know, bring forward an issue, you also brought very uh, tangible solutions and you have active conversations with uh, city staff, which I really appreciate. Um, I guess first with Tim, I, you know, I think that that's a very sound, it seems like a very sound proposal and um, not not the, the huge price tag um, that, you know, as the alternative, but I was wondering in terms of, um, you know, transportation for youth 18 and under, did you have any thoughts on the challenge highlighted in the report um, about the challenge with enforcement um, that it's up to the operators to decipher if someone is 18 or 19? Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I thought that was that was a good point too. Um, that consideration, you never want to put the operator in that position. Um, my my actual hope would be for this three to seven p.m. window on these key routes is that anyone could get on it for free, quite frankly, and then it makes the service extend further to folks who are in the neighborhoods. And you know, we're all trying to inspire people to use transit more and get more active and get healthy again and make community relationships and build communities within communities. Mm -hmm. So that would be, I guess, my backwards way <laughs> to answer that question is if we could extend it further, really, to just make it so that these routes are free to everyone between 3 and 7 p.m. so they get to a rec center, then we wouldn't be putting the operators in that issue. Yeah. And no. Frankly, the bus will probably mostly be full with teens anyways. So Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, I absolutely hear where you're coming from, and that's kind of was my a bit of my thought process on actually on this report uh, in general as well. Um, and I guess that two hundred fifty-eight thousand dollar kind of estimate mm -hmm. it doesn't count for um, kind of I, I guess what's the word like um, like lost revenue or whatever just from um, the the potential of yes letting more people on Correct. regardless of their age all for free. So yeah. just want to that. that. That's right. I I took the general number of the, you know I think it's around thirty-seven is the seated spaces on the typical bus. I took. 40 as a number and assume they were all teens and the, the lowest mm -hmm. cost per per ticket that you could get it with a ten dollar book it uh, book mm -hmm. so two dollars um, and that's where that cost estimate came from the, the big one obviously is where we create two new routes because those be essentially become chartered yeah. services so now you're paying 153 dollars an hour is the new chartered service rate come january i believe and you'll need about four hours per route so that's and currently and currently you charter school buses mm -hmm. So there's a cost, like there's a cost that you are incurring as an organization. So with the two new routes, like you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be having any of this transportation cost as an organization. Is that what I'm hearing? Correct. Yeah. And okay. it would also service just any youth who's wanting to get to the rec center. Yes, it has a benefit to the free play youth, but it has a benefit to any youth who wants to go to right. rec center. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, I guess Cynthia, Marco, a uh, question for you. Um, I, I actually spoke with some of your organizations recently about, you know, uh, you know, the project and various things you're working on that 2018 policy access without fear. Um, I thought there would be accommodation following that policy, but it sounds like in practice, people are still being asked for ID for address and whatnot, but that undermines the principle of that policy passed in the first place. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Um, I think since uh, 2018, um, when it was passed, um, there has been, um, I guess, low movement in terms of how it's uh, it would uh, roll out. Um, but also, I think this is also new for the city um, and for the organizations. Uh, that's why it takes a while. But um, I think now is the time to move forward, um, and we're uh, really happy to be able to help uh, in terms of getting that um, you know the partnership. Moving forward. Yeah, and then did you say this, like what's the status of the partnership? Is it in place already? Is it? Um, not, not yet, um, uh, not at the moment. There's still formal um, uh, partnership, um, but I guess when we were talking uh, to the staff, particularly around the uh, bus passes, um, the, the pilot project um, will, um, I guess, uh, deal with um, the current, um, uh, Undocumented that we, that we have access to, you know. So that's approximately between 75 to 100 undocumented migrants 
uh, that uh, that uh, came to our organizations. Yeah. Okay, great. great. Thank you so much. I'm out of time. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Councillor Tang. Uh, I'll go to Councillor Rutherford now. Uh, great, thank you. Um, so I'm going to just go to, to free play for a little bit on your proposal. Uh, are you aware of how challenging of an operational budget we're going to be dealing with with transit and some of the trade-offs we're going to have to really, really look at with transit this coming budget? A little bit, yep. <laughs> yep. Like that on demand isn't a, won't potentially be funded and we have to think about funding on demand. Mm -hmm. Yep. And and I'm sure you're aware that like we as a council have to look at like the whole city and what benefits the whole city as opposed to one specific area. I agree. Yep. So I guess with that in mind, sell me on why I as a North West councillor should consider this proposal because at this point it, it would be a hard sell for me yeah i think the we picked some of the routes that were the most efficient to get to a recreation center so i would hope to be able to work with your area and, and edmonton transit to look at other routes that can get us to a northwest recreation center or get kids from the further northwest to uh an appropriate recreation center but as you're well aware as well, that there's a deficit in that northwest and west region for recreation amenities or place, large places to take kids to participate and gather and make community. Um, so we've been working a lot with the schools there um, uh, as well as trying to build a capacity in the community centers. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd be very interested to talk with you or, or talk to other folks about how we create similar style routes from the northwest to get kids to those rec centers. and. The farthest west, as you see at the moment, is is those ones along St. Effects and Jasper Place and Britannia. Going to Twiller, and we have to take them to Twiller because there isn't any space to take them into in the West End right now. So I, I, I guess I couldn't give you a great sale on that. I'm just say that I would be happy to work with you about how we can make sure kids in the Northwest get the same access as everybody else, and that's the goal. But I, I totally respect you're in a, in a tough challenge. Yeah, I mean, this 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 budget, you know, we talk about recreation. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to decide on things like you, like you mentioned about the operation of the limited recreation that is in the north. Yeah. And there's only so many operational dollars to go around. So, mm -hmm. um, I'm just, you know, I want to see this. I'd like to see it, like you mentioned, with all the rec centers, Clearview, Twilliger, all the city, you know, even Commonwealth. Yep. Um, and. I'm really hard, struggling to to consolidate your proposal with the, the budget reality we're 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 truly facing on the operational side. Mm -hmm. I understand. That's fair. Because I mean, did you were, are you aware that uh, our funding for the uh, the tr the for per, our provincial funding for the transit the ride transit passes is uh, set to expire in the spring of 2023. Mm -hmm. As an example, and we don't know if we're going to be even getting that funding mm -hmm. yeah. further extended. Yeah, Council, Council Rutherford, I just, I just maybe want to suggest that, um, you know, I think it's our community groups to come forward to us to, to provide the suggestions that they think we need to consider and then for us to, to consider those. But do you have any f further questions of uh, either of our speakers? Yeah, I think that my, my question was around the are are you aware of that funding and the 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 expiration of it yeah i'm, I'm aware that there's a a lot of uh, budgetary constraints at the moment and uh, mm -hmm. i appreciate that the pressure that you're under and i just appreciate that you're taking time to to listen and hopefully i can do a good job of helping you through these challenging times too so that we service everyone that's my goal and i rec respect that you're in a tough spot so and yeah, I'm sorry you're no, there. I'll do my best to, to make sure that kids have access to mentorship, community, belonging, and uh, however I can work with you and everyone at council administration to do that, I'm in. I would I would be interested, and I would be interested yeah. if you're interested. For sure. Thank in, you so much. In, um, in expanding, like I think the proposal is good for, for that area. Mm -hmm. 
I, I would say to table a proposal like that, I would be more interested if it. Oh, Councillor Rutherford, we've lost you. I will re I'll make sure to reach out. Yeah. <laughs> great. Thank you. Very yeah, much, that Councilor would be Rutherford. great. Cause I think that if that there would be a stronger case if we could say we're doing that for all the rec centers. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Councillor. Excellent. Thanks, Councillor Rutherford. Uh, Councillor Wright. Thank you very much. Um, I guess, Tim, I'll start with you. Can we shave off a little bit of the, the, the cost associated and maybe look at it um, on the youth that would potentially need a ride more than others? Um, so I'm thinking 16 years old, you can get a license, right? Um, so if we looked at maybe just um, maybe 16 and under, would do you have any sort of uh, data to sort of show what 17 and 18 year olds would cost us? I, I wouldn't have strong data on that, okay. but I can tell you that most of the families we serve don't have a car and don't have a license. Okay. Um, and it's actually one of the biggest barriers as well to employment, right? Is if you can't get around the city, you can't get a job. Yeah. Um, so it's one of the things we're trying to take on as an organization. One of the other things we're trying to take on. So I, d I don't think I'd have a great answer on, on delineating the two of you know, could the 17 year, 18 year olds get there easier than the 16 year olds? I think my answer would be no. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, just be truthful. Okay. No, yep. I'm just trying to yep. Yep. save Thank money because yeah. no, as I, Councillor Rutherford I, pointed out. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. <laughs> and that um, the cost for the new routes uh, you'd indicate was 258000 and that includes um, like operator salary and fuel and everything like that. Is that correct? Yeah, the new routes total is 195 and when I the total for all of these routes combined was 258. The okay. new routes was 195, and that was based on an estimate working with administration okay. and saying they were like, that's, that's the max. Okay. We, we could streamline this, as mentioned, of eliminating deadheading, using the buses for other things. It would be ways to, to trim that, was okay. my understanding. I went high. Okay, oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. that's always good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, so then on on the route that you had going from Edith Rogers to the Meadows, yes. um, there's other junior highs kind of along the way, right? Or would this just be a direct route that you're looking at? We're looking at that direct route. I mean, we can swing it to go to other spaces too if there's other places to pick up. The Meadows is, is a significant challenge of all the places to get to. It's the Tell hardest. me about it. We don't have the transit <laughs> service out there. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is the hardest, and we have a lot of kids coming from Edith Rogers. It's one of the programs that we've had um, a partnership for a very, very long time. So uh, getting those youth there is a significant challenge, and that springboard of Edith Rogers and doing a stop outside Holy Trinity and Percy Page at the same time, essentially okay. you can have one stop, and then springboarding on from there to Meadows is an efficient route. Right now, the routes to get there, it's taking them 45 minutes or more, yeah. sometimes over an hour. Um, and with the youth initiative, that time block is essentially that 4 to 5 p.m. block. If they get out of school at 3.30, the time block's almost over by the time they get there. Okay. And, and that from those three schools in that area, that would pretty well fill up the bus is what you're saying. The whole thing would be full. I would love to see more buses. Uh, again, you're looking at if you, if you have existing routes, the cost per route is around $6,400. If it's an existing route and you just say, okay, from three till 7 p.m., we're not worrying about the fare. Okay. It's 6,400 bucks. Okay. Yep. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think that's it for you. Thank Cynthia. You. Um, so are, are you aware, so with, with the undocumented families um, not having ID or income verification, um, and you said you've been working with administration, is there anything so that, that we can learn maybe from the, um, the, the program with the Ukrainians um, community that has come over? I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't know if, if they've all come with required ID and, and income verification. Um, or should I be asking administration that? Yeah, with the Ukrainian families, I'm, I'm not quite uh, sure about the processes. Yeah. With okay. the... Uh, the Ukrainian family that, that came um, is under a different program. Um, so yeah. uh, the refugee uh, program that uh, that the, the route um, immediately gets uh, temporary access uh, to, uh, to uh, services um, across Canada. So... Um, uh, those are totally different uh, pathways in terms of um, uh, services.
Okay, okay, and I'll, I'll maybe get some more details from them, from mm -hmm. admin. Um, and, and I'm sorry, how many, how would, can you estimate sort of how many families um, that we'd be looking at uh, that are undocumented? We're looking at like from 75 to 100 families. Okay. Where we can distribute mm -hmm. the passes, yes. Okay. There's approximately um, uh, 50,000 to 7, uh, 70,000 undocumented migrants in the province. Uh, and we're approximating, and this is anecdotal from uh, services that a quarter of that li live in Edmonton. No? So that's approximately uh, 1,700. Okay. Um, and uh, currently, uh, I guess, as I mentioned, uh, under the pilot project, we have access to between 70 to 100 uh, undocumented migrants. Okay. And their families. Great. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, thanks to both of our, all of our panel members. Uh, that concludes all the questions that uh, we had for you. But again, really appreciate you taking the time uh, to share your, your thoughts and insights with us. So we'll now switch back to our staff delegation uh, for questions of administration. We'll just give a moment uh, to, to turn over there. Great, well I think everyone is getting settled. Uh, Councillor Knack, I believe you selected this item, so happy to turn to you first. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Stevenson. A few questions, uh, just, just to confirm it, uh, although we heard it from our speaker, related to folks that uh, are undocumented. My understanding of the, of the 2018 conversation as well is that uh, we would work with organizations to ensure that uh, they, the families they're supporting would have access to ride transit and leisure access programs. So it sounds like we, we are working towards making sure we're implementing that because I, again, I think that direction was clear about you know, four years ago when this is discussed. Yes, Councillor Knack, we're currently uh, just recently been working with AWARE and some of the other organizations that work with undocumented workers around a bit of what I talked about in the presentation, um, creating access to ride transit uh, through another form of documentation, such as a letter from an agency um, to support them participating in the program. Perfect. So yeah, you, you're, you're going full steam ahead. That's that you, you have that guidance from Council, so there's no direction needed to, to accomplish that, correct? I don't know if uh, Roger wanted to add anything from the other team. No, okay. Perfect, good, that's great news. Uh, thank you for, for that. Um, so, and I heard this from Mr. Adams, but, but so the numbers that he presented in his slide, you, you have reviewed, do you feel those are relatively accurate or, or would you need to do a, a bit of a deeper dive to come forward with a, a service package if you were gonna consider that? Yes, we have not reviewed uh, some of that detailed information that Mr. Adams presented. Uh, we we would love to do that, and, uh, and so we need to do some more analysis in order to understand what this means. Uh, fair enough. Okay, so you would need direction to, to work with Free Play for Kids to, to look at what implementing that free bus service for youth after school would be like. So, okay, then I'll probably um, make a motion related to that. And I think the only other question I have is, uh, so in regards to making transit free for youth 12 and under without a fair paying adult, I appreciate that um, there needs to be a bit of work. Uh, you would be looking at some of those other municipalities. So, so for example, the city of Regina just implemented it for youth 12 or 13 and under in their case uh, two months ago. And the council uh, approved that uh, in the budget, the total budget to implement that was $2,000. And I appreciate they're a fifth of our size, but we'd be looking at sort of costs of, of similar municipalities to help in, uh, create whatever our budget would be, correct? Correct. And I, I don't, I think we could move forward with that change and, and then assess what the revenue impacts would be rather than needing to bring a, a a, rev, a service package back immediately with the four-year budget. Um, oh, okay. it's a bit, Great. Uh, I might ask Ms. Houghton McDonald if she wants to chime in on that. Uh, sure thing. I think, Councillor, in that instance, it's a bit difficult um, to, you know, anticipate what the impact would be. So it would require a little bit of evaluation on our side. So for the time being, we think it's a very straightforward thing to implement and would uh, understand if that's the direction or will of Council. We can make that happen. Perfect. I'll make a motion related to that as well. And so let me just double check my questions. Because you still need you still need direction around the policy change for that, just to be clear, correct? 
That is correct. Perfect. Um, thank you. That's great. So I'll, I'll make sure we do that. The final question I have is just related to the PATH program. I know, I think we've talked about it before with Scott McDonald and, and Selma, but I just, I know we, we often use that number 1900, but if I remember correctly, we, we've discussed that where an organization potentially needs more because this, that one doesn't have a cost because obviously the individuals accessing that wouldn't be, we're not losing revenue because they can't afford in the first place. If an organization came to you and said, hey, we need a hundred more, we're not going to um, stop that from happening because in, in that case, there's no cost to, to helping those individuals other than capacity of the bus itself, correct? I'll answer that, uh, that's correct. And we're actually currently working on increasing the number of passes based on the most recent count. Um, our challenge now more is the agency's capacity to ad even of administer course. the 1900. It's a, it's a good number for them, but we are absolutely will make more available based on based on the, the need. Love to hear it. Thank you for your work on that. I'll make, uh, if, if we have the wording of the motion, I might as well just put it on the floor in my last 30 seconds. Yes, thank you. Please, please feel free to read that in. Okay, so uh, let's pull it open. I, I don't know if there were any changes made, so I'll read what I had um, and we can tweak based off this, but uh, that administration one prepare amendments to city policy. F uh, oh, there it is. Um, uh, prepare amendments to city policy C four five one H transit fare service policy that would include revisions to the transit user fee schedule that would allow youth riders twelve under twelve. I think it's twelve and under to ride for free without a fare being adult for consideration during the upcoming budget deliberations. And the administration work with free play for kids to develop an unfunded service package for consideration during the twenty. 23 to 2026 operating budget discussion that would provide bus service for youth after school hours to access recreation centers. Um, perfect. So I'll make that motion. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Um, did you, do you need two minutes to introduce that or is it? No, okay. I think the questions were clear, so I'm good. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. I'll go now to Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you. So my question could relate to motion or could relate to presentation and presented by an administration, yes. right? Yeah, we can ask questions on the motion or, or questions of administration on any part of the report. Uh, okay, so first the question about the motion and then if we allow, we change the policy allow under 12 years old, right? And how this align with the other safety policy and then implement the place. And then it's my understanding and for any age 12 under 12, even we don't allow leave them at home. How could we allow them to take public transit? Is there any policy? Can you clarify that a little bit more? And without uh, uh, paid like adults a company. Yeah, we did uh, clarify this when the, the 12 and under was introduced with the fair paying accompaniment. It was originally with a fair paying adult and that was then amended to any fair paying passenger. So right now children 12 and under can ride with another youth um, and we've had that reviewed by, by law um, to get that feedback. But really we, um, we have some uh, I suppose liability when other, whenever youth are riding yep. transit and uh, the it, the making it free without accompaniment did not necessarily greatly in increase that risk profile. I don't know if Ms. Houghton McDonald wants to add to that. And may, no, may, no. May I, agree. Okay, so may I ask further? Under 12, and for example, if one kid is like five years old to come to the, our bus and take the public transit, do we allow that? And without, without the pair and the adult? Her. Currently, they would need to be with another fair paying person, but that could be a fair paying youth under 12. Under 12, like two, five years old case coming. Yes. And just be. to clarify, what Sarah's describing is about the fairing component, but yes, children can use ETS service. I'm not sure if anybody from Law Branch is on the line and wants to weigh in, but we did get legal advice and did a scan a few years ago uh, about this issue, and there's no guidelines that would suggest that we could say uh, that a child can't be using the bus. Uh, whether or not we agree or disagree with it, you know, on a on a personal level. Uh, did the policy also reflect the liability piece and how we define that piece and if something happened? So in terms of who can actually get on our bus and ride it, that's not uh, driven by policy. So there's no policy language about it. Um, 
the piece that is in policy is the fair policy component, which is the idea of children not having to pay a fare. Uh, so, and because right now this uh, motion, the part one is a policy change, what is the key difference and the key implications could, could perceived and with the part one of this motion? I think that the, the key, compared to current policy. Yeah, there will be some youth who currently uh, uh, purchase monthly passes who would now not purchase those passes who are 12 and under um, or who may currently ride a yellow bus and may switch to using transit. And this is why it's a bit difficult to isolate because we don't quite know uh, what the shift would be in terms of, of youth under 12 who currently do purchase passes. Whereas we have a really good un understanding of that for the the, um, the, the passes for 12 and over that we sell to the school boards. So it's the, um, to answer your question, it's, uh, there would likely be additional youth who ride, um, who may have other, who may currently pay or who may use other service currently. Uh, is our current policies already indicated under 12 age and then they don't need to pay and it's free? That is our current policy? Currently, it, um, it's free if they are riding with someone else who has paid. With yes. adult. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the, the next question is about public transit safety. And due to the public transit safety and then still the big concern for the public, and do, can you tell me and do you have sense and we will, due to this issue still in place, we have the youth, kids under 12 years old, and will go to the public transit. And then without the parents, like, like I said earlier, two five years old kid. I, I think there's an, oh, looks like, I think this comes back to what uh, Ms. Hot McDonald was sharing earlier about um, the previous advice from law around we can't, not necessarily say who can or cannot ride transit. It's a public service and it's up to the guardians and parents of youth to make that determination. We can, uh, you know, control the payment, but by restricting access to youth under 12, we might have other challenges that come along with that. My time all. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much, Councillor Rice. I'll go to Councillor Rutherford now. <clears throat> yeah, I think I'm going to continue on that vein just with the motion that was put on the floor. I do have questions about the broader reports, but um, I'm just going to focus on this on this motion. Um, can you, first of all, can you provide it? Can administration provide in a memo that that or yeah, a link to that report that talked about this analysis from I think 2018 you mentioned? Yes, we can definitely do that and follow up, Councillor. Yeah, so I'd appreciate that prior to budget if this is, you know, in, in consideration of those budget deliberations. Uh, because I have a question about the Child, Family, and Youth Enhancement Act. So I don't know if legal is on the phone or on the call. But, for example, it talks about, you know, when children's services can get involved. And so it says when they're abandoned or lost. So I guess a question I would have is how would we assess whether a child is abandoned or lost on transit if there's no supervision? It talks about having the requirement for children to have adequate supervision. And it talks about the need for um, that, that there needs to be reasonable safeguards to protect the safety, security and development of children. And I, I, mem I know that you mentioned about liability, but I just, <laughs> the, it, as somebody that worked for the Office of the Child and Youth Advocate, I do, I just, I do have some concerns. I, I mean, I think there's a balance. We don't want to create unnecessary barriers, which is that fair paying adult, but can legal speak to this? Yes, Councillor, we've asked law if they can join. Maybe uh, we'll wait to see if they're able to join the call and, and come back if that's okay with yes, the Yes, I believe Ms. Jacobson yep. is on the line. Oh, Ms. Jacobs, oh, Mr. Sorry. Bennett. Uh, my, or Mr. Hi. Bennett, yes. hello. Yes, Maddie Bennett here from Legal Services. So I think generally the city has an obligation to make sure that our services, including our buses, are going to be reasonably safe for any user. Um, so 
that includes uh, youth that aren't, aren't accompanied by an adult or their guardian um, right now. And I think changes to the policy about uh, payment and whether a, a fair paying person has to accompany them wouldn't alter that liability one way or another. And when it comes to the act that you'd mentioned, I think it's more focused on the guardian of the child um, rather than the city who would be a, a service provider uh, and it's a service that the child is using. Yeah, I, I get, yes, it is about the guardian, but my question is, so then how do we, or how does the public identify whether a child is at risk? Because right now, if a seven-year-old is riding the bus without an adult, it's easy to identify them as potentially at risk and needing some follow-up from, from caring adults. But if there's a seven-year-old on the bus with no adult, as per this policy, we can't tell whether they're abandoned, lost, or, or just riding the bus. Do you see what I'm trying to say? I think so, and, and maybe I'll I can flip it back to Miss Feldman here. But but my understanding is that the policy change is not going to be moving the needle on the frequency with which we might see a, a child under eighteen riding a bus without a person over eighteen specifically accompanying them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think that the the definition of youth is sixteen plus in that, and then and then. But I mean, I know that like for example, it talks about sort of zero to twelve is the benchmark though it's not written into legislation on you know the age appropriateness taking into consideration developmental abilities etc of youth so that's why they don't put a hard number in there for leaving kids at home um but you know you mentioned about that it's reasonable for safety but can we actually say that can we say with the discussions we've had about transit safety and downtown safety can we say that the transit is reasonably safe right now for youth and children on their own? Like, can we let, like, from a risk perspective, actually say that with the conversations we've had, or would there be a case for that? I think that's a, that's a bigger question. Uh, yeah. I think what we can say right now is that we have, like, in addition to the, the physical safety of the vehicles, uh, we have our operators, we have our peace officers, we have city staff, and, and they understand their obligations to make sure that all of the riders are reasonably safe when they're using our services. Okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks very much, Councillor Rutherford. You know, I'll just um, pick up on that as well. So just, just for my understanding, so right now a youth under 12 is fully able to ride ETS. They just have to, to pay. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So so again, that's that's already permitted. It's just not currently free. Um, so it there's the potential that the frequency increases if, if more children are accessing that, but, uh, but the, the principle, the ability to, for a five-year-old to ride transit now exists, um, just comes at a cost. Absolutely, and the, the ability for a five-year-old right now to ride with another five-year-old who has paid and that five-year-old to be free also exists. Right, okay, well thank you. Sorry, I'm just picturing all these cute five-year-olds riding around on buses, which, um, <laughs> but no, I, I, I don't mean to make light of the question though. It is, it is really important that we're considering the safety implications and um, uh, you know, weighing, weighing the full implications of this, absolutely. So, so appreciate the questions from my colleagues and appreciate that clarification. You know, I'm really pleased. I think, I think, you know, my, I'm really interested in the work around providing sort of a path uh, like relationship-based program for undocumented Edmontonians. So I'm so pleased to hear that that work is underway. Um, also really pleased with the work uh, that you've been doing with Enoch and just want to confirm that I heard that you are moving forward with implementing the ideas that they've, they've flagged in terms of the bulk leisure pass access and the free transit tickets or discounted? Yes, we just haven't uh, finished those next steps, but we are, we're moving forward towards implementing once we confirm the details with them. Wonderful. It is just lovely to, to not have to be directing any of this work, that it's already happening. That's, that's great to hear. Thank you so much. Um, you know, the, the one thing that came up for me, you know, I think it's interesting that we provide passes for children in care. You know, I, I support that in principle, but just wondering what, if any, conversations we've had with the province about sort of a more comprehensive bulk discount program for them and, and for the folks that are accessing benefits through them, so either children in care, people on AISH. Have we ever talked to the province about cost sharing um, for those specific programs? 
So I can chime in to help uh, help Sarah out. We've had a lot of conversations over the years with the province um, trying to navigate, you know, whether it's eligibility criteria or different needs. Um, you know, very grateful for the support that we have, but it is temporary support from them. Uh, so I would say, you know, we could look at ongoing, um, you know, kind of communications about this, but there's, there's certainly not a sense of certainty yet in terms of, um, you know, their willingness to kind of uh, continue to support these types of, of programs. Great. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, a colleague flagged earlier, just the risk coming up in 2023 with um, the loss in that uh, subsidy. So can you, are there active conversations right now about renewing that agreement? Um, just wondering again, what, what we can maybe do on our part um, on council in terms of some of the advocacy we might be able to do. Yeah, we did recently learn from our government of Alberta partners that we are that they are open to an extension for one year. So we're currently working on the, that amendment. Uh, the agreement is for both Calgary and Edmonton. So we know the program uh, will be extended to the spring of 2024, and then we'll see uh, what comes next after that. Okay, well that's encouraging. I, that's great news, and I appreciate our provincial partners for that extension. It's it's clearly a really valuable program. So so grateful to them for for stepping up with that one year extension. My last question is just, um, again, other exciting things that are happening. The Mobility Choices Travel Training Program, I thought was a really neat model, and was wondering, again, if there's been contemplation of expanding that to, you know, very broad, broad-based Edmontonians who maybe just haven't used transit before, are, are interested in kind of having that, that concierge model to get to know the system a bit better. Yeah, great question. Uh, there was actually a report uh, from the Transit Advisory Board last year talking about uh, and including this idea and we're committed to, to expanding our travel training program. Uh, traditionally, we've been focused a lot on seniors and uh, pe persons with disabilities, uh, but that report talked about working, for example, with newcomers um, and, and other types of Edmontonians who might just need to be more familiar with the system. So we're going to incrementally increase. There's some... Uh, with, stat, with the support from our, our resources that we have uh, to make that happen. Wow, fantastic, fantastic. Well, so much great news this morning. Uh, thank you very much. I'll move now to other council members. So, uh, Councillor Tang. Great, thank you so much. Uh, really fascinating reports, really appreciate the work. Um, I'll start with 7.1. Um, so 12 years old, that's what, grade six on average? Is that right? Grade six or seven. I think. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, in the past, I've certainly seen other jurisdictions, uh, and I recognize that you have done that scan already, um, that also works with school boards to, to, do, to do, like, you know, workshops and, and teach kids how to, about transit safety and best practices and etiquette and all that. Is that something we've, we're in conversation with just in terms of working with schools? Absolutely, that's one of the pieces around expanding travel training and outreach. We used to do a bit more of it and we want to bring more of those programs back. So uh, we have, over the last number of years, worked with City Hall School, but we have other opportunities to work directly with the schools and the school boards yeah. to uh, work on that. Yeah. yeah, and I think grade six is sort of the target sweet swap because you're, it's the age they're actually looking for a lot of independence and, and transit is a, is, a, is a major pathway for that. Hey. Um, and I and I recognize that you know there is a mention of lost revenue mentioned in the report, but I'm also curious about what what a, what's the implication for say projection for for long term revenue increase because we're also cultivating lifelong uh, transit behavior that may not manifest itself for I don't know five ten years down the road, right? So I'll jump in on that piece. I don't think it's a tangible. Uh, you know, set of financial analysis that can be completed uh, because it's a future oriented uh, assumption. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, you know, contemplating kind of what we can assess uh, with known factors and that one, you know, I agree with you in, in theory, um, but I think that would be really difficult to try and quantify. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I'll be curious, uh, you know, as you, you do your research, um, you know, what the evidence says about about that, if anybody, if any academics out there do, that does this kind of work. Um, and I was curious about some of the inconsistency mentioned just in terms of some places allow, some places doesn't allow uh, youth uh, 12 and under to write independently. But do you think, um, you know, our work in the regional transit to my help smooth that inconsistency out a bit? 
I can jump in, Sarah, if you'd like, and then you can add to it. Um, right now, there hasn't been any work done yet on fair policy uh, at a regional uh, commission level. So we've been anxiously kind of awaiting, uh, you know, to start that process and understand what the objectives are. I yeah. think it's going to be decision points for each municipality because there's inconsistencies. Um, looking at, you know, what are the individual decisions of each regional uh, partner? And then looking at uh, you know the goals of the commission and what they want to achieve through their policy. Sure. Yeah. And um, I have a few more questions, so I just kind of plow through these um, and just ensuring some uh, logistical challenges you flagged in the report. But don't you think technologies like Arc System and you know um, that will take that burden off of the operator to discern whether someone is of certain age or what and whatnot? Not really, because the Arc cards. Uh, sorry, Sarah. Um, if you're riding for free, ARC isn't an ID card. So ARC is really, you know, your, your, it's like your paper fare pass. So it doesn't simplify the process of understanding who would be eligible for fare free and who wouldn't. Okay, so there's, oh, all right. Well, I, I think I have some technical questions around there then, but I, I can follow up offline. Um, and then if you increase the age limit to 18, would it affect the UPASS policy at all? Would, there, there could be some spillover to you pass and also all of the school passes we sell to the school boards currently for high school yeah. and junior high and yeah. ride transit as well. Yeah, um, a question for the mover uh, on the motions uh, for that second one is the intention for the unfunded service package for a pilot. Uh, I didn't No, I hadn't intended pilot. Um, um, I, yep. I guess I'm just wondering if it's around that, that 258,000 number um, Tim had quoted earlier. And, and that's what I hope to, by having a min work with free play, it could confirm whether that number's I see. fair. Or, yeah, yeah, because I know there's a few different options uh, for that short term uh, options. And I guess to administration, my last question, uh, in your conversation with free play, and I should have asked him this earlier, but has there ever been any consideration for cost share in this pilot, for example, leveraging the funds that they will otherwise use for the charter school bus they currently use in the program? So I think that's some of the challenge. We have a lot of analysis that we need to complete for this item. I think it's going to be very difficult, if not impossible, to bring it forward for this budget deliberation, given where we're at in terms of, of it being the end of October. We need to analyze, uh, you know, the costing in more detail, the service planning. We need to understand our fleet implications um, and just be able to have the time to work through it with uh, all of the different organizations, including uh, free play. So I'm a little concerned about part two and the timing. I would love to bring a more fulsome report back. For sure. Uh, yeah. All the analysis. Yeah, my, my time is up, but I think that's fair consideration for committee members. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Uh, Councillor Wright. Thank you very much. Um, so I guess we'll leave that up to committee to decide whether they want to do an amendment maybe for SOBA or something. Okay. Um, on on the presentation on, on slide number seven, um, we talk about the, um, sorry, the operating expenses. It's not an actual cost, right, for, for the fares. It's just sort of just a value that's in there. The value of the subsidy is accounted for in our reporting to the government, the government of Alberta, and when the program was originally funded, and, and Ms. Houghton McDonald might want to uh, add a bit on the history, we did have council fund the amount of subsidy, and this is due to the fact that uh, from work we've done with Treasury in the city and also with the city auditor around accounting for the value of fair product as, as foregone potential revenue. So what what is that actual number? Because that's... I don't, I might need to just pull out. Okay, the, if you don't have it quick, that's yeah. okay, that's fine. Just, just, just follow just up curious. with that with you. Okay. And um, so the work that you've done with Enoch, I think is great. Um, and sort of, I guess, lessons learned from that. Um, can that be um, carried over, um, you know, looking at other undocumented or looking at undocumented workers? Like, do you, do you, is there a requirement to, to confirm that ID and, and income and that with, uh, in the agreement with Enoch? So with Enoch, we originally approached it as how can we provide access to ride transit where there's an application form and what kind of documentation people would need. And that is one barrier we were discussing with them about having that proof of, of low income. Uh, but the bigger, the, the larger piece of feedback we heard was 
uh, that that the demand for monthly pass isn't really what what they're seeking. That's what we've heard so far. It's more tickets or to, for the occasional use, and that is product we would just provide without any application. So that's what we're working on right now. If the demand desire did come back to look at ride transit in the future, then we would start exploring what kind of documentation. How could we make that work? Okay. Yeah. And and are there other I guess newcomer un undocumented groups that you could be engaging with as well? besides Cynthia and the Filipino community? Yeah, there is one organization that Cynthia referred to, uh, AWARE, and another group that has been working with uh, Social Development Branch on this topic. So I think we'll continue to work with them okay. to understand what are the organizations that serve newcomers that we can work with on this piece. Okay, so a sort of a, a broader view of the whole situation then, okay. Um, oh, and then I just, you, you've expanded sort of the um, eligibility requirements for income in that verification. What about for identification? Can, can one of the social agencies say this is this person without them providing a, like a government of Alberta ID or driver's license? I'll just ask Ms. Lawson from Rec Recreation and Culture okay. to chime in. Thank you. I can respond to that. So, um, no, we don't, we take the word of the social, a pre-approved social service agency. Sorry, you said no, we don't take the word? Or no, we, we take their <laughs> word for it. Okay. For, their, for the social servants, service agencies that have been pre-approved. Okay, for identification of the individual. Yes. Okay, perfect, great. Um, that's, um, I think that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Paquette. Councillor Paquette, we can't hear you. No, you're not on mute. Aha, you've got something. We could do, we could do charades. You want me to move to the next? Okay, uh, I'll go to Councillor Rice for a second round. Uh, thank you. So, do you have the data and specific indicate how many um, youth under 12 years old and actually use our public transit by themselves? And the cur currently? I think that's one of the reasons why in the report we suggest that it's difficult for the 12 and under to isolate the financial impact of a change because we don't have great data right now on how many youth 12 and under ride and how many ride unaccompanied um, or pay and ride or, or ride free and accompanied. So that's the additional research we could do. But as Ms. Houghton McDonald suggested, um, we could move forward with changing that policy without um, seeking additional budget at this time. Okay, um, specifically, and did we heard lots of public concerns or public demandings for this policy change and um, for under 12 years old, our Edmontonians to take the right by themselves? I, so far, as a councillor, and I visit my neighborhood, my 30 neighborhoods often, and in the first thing, I never heard this request. Our analysis mainly is from the council motion that we look at this. We certainly hear it like any items, occasionally hear about this, but we haven't heard a lot of, a lot of the community asking for this. So if this is not public, public uh, asking and why and uh, we are doing and uh, during this budget cycle and specifically we have so limited resources. So is that question to us or to the mover? Uh, to the mover or administration sure, could provide thanks. that your input as well. Yeah, thanks for the question. So as, as we heard, there's, uh, you know, not expected to be what I would consider a substantial cost. Even using that Regina example, we'd be talking about $10,000 potentially annually. And to help create a culture of ridership in our city, I think there's there's value in making that change. So if we're talking about something that uh, has a very insignificant cost and can help build up uh, greater ridership in our city, I, I don't see um, how that would create harm. Uh, but build great ridership is not start from the risk and puts our 
12 years under and people in the public transit. And so I, I just want to get that point out there. Uh, another, another question, another question is about the capacity of our recreation center. And because I'm hurting, I'm, I'm hearing today uh, is we talk about increases uh, public transit rather and from uh, use and go to our recreation center. And then does that mean, does that mean uh, our current recreation center, the usage for all this, those centers, the capacity is not there. We need more uh, provide us more solution and for more people to use our recreation center. Is this one of the intention for the motion, for today's motion, or, or rather we just received uh, administration's reports as information today and then we can look in further and then for the part one and the part two and not specific during budget deliberation. And we have so many items like uh, Councilor Rutherford mentioned earlier. Councilor, I could speak to the capacity in recreation centers. I'm not sure okay. the, who can answer so that. So, yeah, I, I'm confusing for this collection because 7.1 and 7.2 we link to do, together to deal with. And if there is capacity uh, concern there, we want to incre increase the readership and for people to go there and specifically for the youth under 12 years. And then, that, for me, this motion doesn't make any sense. So there, there's certainly capacity in the larger centers. Um, that's why we're working with many of the agencies to offer more free after school programming, uh, in, for, including free play and many other, not eight other organizations now. Um, some of the smaller facilities don't have capacity. A single pad arena may have another youth program on there, a figure skating lesson. Um, so it really varies on, but the bigger ones that, that Mr. Adams was speaking to do, do have capacity. Uh, okay, uh, so for the, for the part two, I heard, and the part two, we're going to move, uh, come back later, right? And so yes. then I, I can save and my question for that. Thank you. And Councillor Rice, sorry, uh, online folks are having trouble hearing you. Do you mind just trying the mic next door? The next but mic I, over? I have no problem for this one. And then it's not about my end, it's about oh, sure. another end. Yes, well, it's true. And then there is no, prob no problem in, in the meeting right now. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll circle back to Councillor Paquette who hasn't had a first round yet and we'll see if we've got sound up and running for you. Let's find out, can you hear me? Success, please oh. go ahead, wonderful, right. thank you. Add IT to my list of skills, just kidding. Did Do you not. turn it off and turn it off again? I did. Success, you, you yeah. amazing. Okay, sorry, go ahead, we'll, we'll restart your time or I'll give you a bit of extra time. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so, gratefully, a lot of my questions have been asked, um, which is not a surprise. Great counsel. Um, so, I've just got a quick question about um, uh, attachment five. There was uh, in in one of the uh, suggestions, there was um, sort of just basically comping passes for folks on H. And I'm wondering if we've given any consideration to that further than just a, a suggestion in an attachment. So in terms of H, I can start, Sarah, and then you can you can jump in. Um, so there used to be a separate H uh, pass that was provided that got rolled into the ride transit program design that council approved. So they yeah. get a subsidized pass through uh, our ride transit program. So we hadn't been contemplating uh, changing that approach, but I'm not sure, Sarah, if you want to talk about some of the conversations. No, that's that's accurate. We, in the reports, I would just say we reflected everything we heard, although sometimes there are some participants who may be less familiar with how the programs work, and so comments may not reflect always understanding what is available to them. And that's one piece we'll be working on with the outreach and awareness. Okay. Um, it's just uh, what we know is that uh, H is not indexed to inflation. So essentially their bus pass are going up quite a bit every uh, year, especially in relation to uh, the minimal amount that they have to live on per month. So I'm just wondering if there's any contemplation of working with uh, provincial government on this uh, to see if there's some way to, uh, I mean, I know, but we still have to try uh, some way to um, 
maybe support each uh, recipients, at least with, with transportation. So right now it's our pricing uh, figure that applies. So I understand what you're saying about the proportion of that cost yeah. relative to their benefit. We can share uh, that feedback with them. I would say if council wants uh, to be a bit more firm, uh, you know, to direct us to do something more specific, we can take that direction. Um, but otherwise we'll share that in our next uh, follow-up meeting with our provincial administration counterparts. Yeah, that would be great. Um, uh, additionally, uh, speaking about uh, this, I think it was raised already, but are we um, are we working with uh, our counterparts on the Canadian government uh, when it comes to uh, maybe assisting us? I know they don't really get involved with operations, but maybe times have changed because we've got refugees, we've got new immigrants, we've got uh, Indigenous folks coming to town. And as a municipality, we are covering the bulk of those costs when it comes to transportation. So I'm wondering if uh, we can make that case to the provincial and federal governments as well, as far as operating. And I know it's something they probably wouldn't want to open the door to because it means they have to do it with every municipality, but maybe it's it's time to have that conversation. We've certainly been advocating for operating support in addition to capital. Um, and, you know, I, the CUDA Canadian Association uh, for Transit Agencies has been doing the same. Uh, so I think incorporating some of these components into that advocacy work makes sense. And again, if there's something more direct that council wishes to uh, direct admin on, happy to take that direction as well. But yes, I, I agree. And we can weave that in to existing work. Okay. Well, I can't give any direction on our committee, uh, but uh, <laughs> just to, what happens if a five-year-old or seven-year-old hops on the bus today? So we have operators who are highly trained uh, to look after the care of really all riders with a specific focus on vulnerable riders as well as children. Um, we have a lot of support from inspectors that monitor the service. And then we have our transit peace officers as well. We've heard some really amazing stories of operators quickly intervening, suspecting someone might be lost, et cetera, reuniting kids with with their guardians. Uh, they contact control right away. We engage police as necessary. Um, so there's a lot of training provided for those kind of rare circumstances should they occur in the system. Okay, and if we change fare schedules, will any of that change? No, none of that changes by changing the schedules. Yeah. Okay, so I think we've, we've uh, put that to rest. All right, well, uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Um, Councillor Rutherford, you're up next. Yeah, so I think I'm just gonna shift focus. I, I might have a potential amendment to point two, but I, I do have some broader questions about the report that I haven't had a chance to get to yet. And specifically, I wanted to, I have two questions. One around the GBA plus analysis on 7.1, and I'm sorry if you can hear sawing in the background. Um, I guess I didn't, one thing I saw missing in that GBA plus analysis analysis is have you looked at the current eligibility and what groups are not having a big uptake in this program because i didn't see that reflected in the gba plus analysis so if we looked at okay well we have we have these programs but we see that this specific demographic isn't really taking this up that could that is that's a great question counselor uh we ha certainly have the data um we didn't do that analysis for this report so i think that would be um one piece we can look at, particularly also how they've come back throughout the pandemic but for the different eligibility mm -hmm. categories. So um, we can take that away and do some more. I'm not sure if on the LAP side, is there anything to add? Yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah. And so, yeah, that would be great. I would really appreciate that because I think that's the kind of work that in a GBA plus analysis is really going to tell us what, who we're intending to serve and are we actually serving that and who are we missing, right? So. I think that's really important. I think all the mechanisms that we have, the ride transit, the, 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 all the programs for, for people with age, all of those are fantastic, but I would like to see that more in depth analysis. My second question though, is on, I heard in your presentation about that you're using LICO before tax as opposed to LICO after tax which I find interesting. Would someone from administration want to speak to that? Is 
So we currently use the um, LICO, the gross income. Yeah, that's, on the that's of before tax. Yeah. And why is that as opposed to after tax? I think my understanding and uh, Mr. Jevney or Ms. Lawson can correct me if I'm wrong is that uh, LICO is determined on that before tax income. And so that's been how since the programs are introduced, LICO has been that way. Um, well, there's LICO before tax and after tax. And the reason I say that we should probably explore this a bit further is that after tax is more reflective of how much actual dollars people have to, to spend, right? Mm -hmm. And in addition, it, it's more reflective of, let's say, a market back basket measure, which I've talked about before in terms of the spendability. So I, I, I would, and I don't know if you need, a, I guess my question is, do you need a motion to explore that a bit further about the benefits or the implications of making that cut off after tax as opposed to before tax? I think, uh, Councillor Rutherford, it's really great feedback. Uh, when we did the initial design, just being totally honest, I don't even think that was ever contemplated to look at one or the other. Yeah. Um, so happy to take that away. We don't need a motion. Uh, we exactly. will dig into that and then we can have some follow up uh, as needed with council and just appreciate you flight, you know, kind of flagging that. Yeah, I, I would like to dig into that and in the, the difference yep. because yeah, there, the, if you go to like Stats Canada, they have both uh, the LICO before and after tax and they're different numbers, but there's a lot of things that can affect somebody's gross versus their actual take home. And so I think that there can be some, some benefits to looking at the difference and uh, both positive benefits and negative benefits of using either. So that would be great. I'd appreciate that work. Yeah, Councillor, it's Roger Chivin here. The only thing I would add is we did look at a number of income cutoffs and in, in different measures and landed on, on the one that we use now. So if we're going to do that analysis, we should likely look at what other possible measures would be and then come back with our recommendation. I would agree. And if you've already done that work, then I would have liked to have seen it in this report would be my only other comment to that because I, I think if there's rationale for how we got to uh, before tax, for example, I'd want to know that. So that if it can be in the form of a memo or a future report that this is coming back at, it doesn't matter to me, but I do, that is information that I am curious about. Because I do think that if we want it to be really barrier free, we should actually look at market basket as opposed to LICO. But LICO is way more judicious and stable. Um, I've run out of time to make any potential amendments. My question, I guess, for the, was for point two, if it could, rather than being an unfunded service package, if it could be more of direction to work with free play on a pilot that could come back as a report, a potential report in Q1, what would um, Edmund say to that? Thanks, and I'll, I'll, I will follow up on that in my round of questions. Um, Perfect, thank you. Thank you, Chair, <laughs> you Madam bet. Chair. <laughs> yeah, so um, looking for your thoughts there, appreciate the, the tight turnaround that would be required for this budget. I think um, I've heard my colleagues express, some of my colleagues, you know, really want to see something happen fast. We don't necessarily want to um, have a lot of reporting back before we start to see an implementation, but also recognizing we need to balance that against the analysis you need to do. Uh, so just looking maybe to administration in terms of what uh, what type of motion do, would you think balance, balance those two effectively? So I think there's two streams of work. There's one that's already underway with Mr. Adams. Really appreciate his kind of willingness to work with us and we're collaborating with um, uh, recreation as well. So we will take care of needs in the short term. Uh, we don't need a motion to that effect. We're already working on it and exploring lots of different options, including trip plans for existing service to get to all the rec centers for all Edmontonians. The second one would be if we want to do the proper research and analysis into exploring, uh, you know, sp option specific in this context for youth uh, to get connected to rec, I would actually propose a Q2 timing because there's quite a bit of different angles that need to be analyzed and to be able to bring back a more fulsome report, Q1 would be a little bit tight um, and not give us much time to actually do the analysis. Okay, well, I will do the dangerous thing of trying to craft um, an amendment on the fly. So, so I would propose that we replace um, point two with uh, that administration report back on options to support youth accessing recreation facilities. 
uh, in Q2. Does that sound about right? Yes. Oh, per oh. <laughs> yeah, the oh, perfect. Well, there you go. Um, yes, and we, we can vote on the two points separately, absolutely. So I will, I will put that amendment on the floor and, and anything close to that wording that uh, clerks has uh, to put up on the screen, uh, I would be happy with. So to confirm, Councillor Stevenson, um, are you suggesting the following, um, that the motion on the floor be amended by deleting part two and replacing it with that administration return to committee with a report outlining an approach and work plan that would establish a pilot program for providing bus service for youth after school hours to access recreational centers uh, with the due date of quarter two, 2023? Yeah, and maybe I'll just clarify the pilot project piece. Is that, is that operative? Um, I guess, yeah, we want to see action, so the pilot project directs us in that way, I guess. Yeah, I don't know if Ms. Hart might on it, it could, Councillor. The only thing I would mention, too, is that we do have an unfunded service package coming forward. Last year, Council provided free play for kids, uh, free play, a $600,000 one-time grant. So there will be a service package coming. We've had discussions with Mr. Adams about what that funding would be for and could it fund some of the transportation pieces or is it required fully for their program. So there, there will be a package coming and still discussion about how to best utilize those funds. And just to add to that, we also have an unfunded service package that Council directed us during the on-demand report about off-peak service, and that is one place where we see opportunity to support uh, this type of travel. Um, the pilot piece might be more on the fairing aspect that we need to explore. Gotcha. Okay. Um, well, let's, let's proceed with uh, the wording as, as suggested, and then very open to my uh, colleagues' comments on, on that. I'm mindful of our time where we've got nine minutes left. Uh, in a perfect world, we would, we would allow our delegation to, to go at noon and, and get their afternoon back, but uh, certainly don't want to curtail conversation on this important topic. So if we could get the wording of that proposed amendment up. Councillor uh, Stevenson, my apologies, but do you want to separate the question um, and have a subsequent motion or just pr proceed with an amendment? Both options would work. Apologies, could you repeat the options? Yeah, so option one would be that we amend the motion as I previously mentioned, and option two would be that we amend the motion by simply deleting part two, and then we have a subsequent motion around that pilot program, which I think speaks to Councillor Rice's request. Sure, you know what I like about that is that we could deal with um, one, and then we could work together over the lunch hour to come up with something for point two, which we could pass as a subsequent later in the meeting. So that would allow our delegation to be free. Um, well, I guess, I guess you can't really be free. Well, you know, I would love to just hear from my colleagues. Uh, I think what I would be comfortable voting on what we have uh, up there right now, um, but happy to turn to other members of committee. I, I will go to Councillor Tang right now, though, as she has not had a second round. Uh, though I'm not a committee member, I I like it. I'll just say that um, just some out final outstanding questions from 7.2 uh, specifically. Um, do you, do you have a dollar value for the total amount of reduced fare or donated rice contributed annually? Uh, I wouldn't. I don't have that off off the top. Okay. Um, you can you can send it to me offline. Thank you. Um, and then I was wondering, uh, what's the participation rate in that Alberta Fine Options program, and and is the program well known and well accessed? Uh, so the Alberta Fine Options program was actually paused during the pandemic and recently came back. Um, we'd need yeah. to, I think, connect, connect with the province and see if they could share data with us on that. Um, That's great. Involved. And I imagine the pandemic also affected ticketing as well since there's period when transit was free. Um, and then finally, I was curious if both of these reports have been reviewed by the advisory bodies like ETSAP, ARAC, and AAC, Accessibility Advisory Committee. So we did not... Uh, we did provide an overview to ETSAB as we do of all of our reports. Uh, we haven't consulted specifically with AAC or ARAC or the other committees on this report. And I think that's some of the follow-up work we talked about, particularly on the anti-racism review, uh, going to ARAC and others to, to, to talk about our next steps and hear more thoughts. Okay, great. Thank you so much for all this work and, uh, and uh, thank the committee members for deliberating on this motion. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Rice? Uh, one quick question for the amendment, uh, part two. 
So for use, do we, do we need to specific the use age? And then all this use is covered all ages. Currently, are we define youth in, in overall as 24 and under for um, accessing our, our youth product. And so for the, the free, uh, fair free piece, that's 12 and under. So we do need to specify an age so we can distinguish it from the 24 and under youth category. And because in for this pilot project it is to serve um, kids and under 12, uh, and also to start to save use and for high school students. And then I, I think it's better to have the age specifically in this um, motion. Uh, well, I guess I was the mover of the amendment. I think um, I, I'm happy with, with the broader interpretation in terms of looking at all youth from uh, 18 and under. Uh, also, this is a uh, is related to part one, and we will vote separate. Yes, we can. And then because after, because in like uh, part one, we are allow the under twelve uh, to take right. That means this will apply that as well. And then I I do have the concern for the risk and the safety and for the under twelve. I appreciate that. Thank you. We'll definitely split those out for for voting purposes. And then do. You, would you like Would you like me to speak right now, or waiting for all the questions to speak for the motion? Uh, I'd be happy for you to speak. That that works. We're going to do it. I think we're going to make it. If we need to <laughs> extend orders by maybe a few minutes, but please, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, okay, I just uh, uh, quickly say and uh, quickly say in for this motion and separate the, for two votes. Uh, I will not support the part one, but I will support. Part two. Uh, the reason, uh, the reason for me to say that I, I would like to say, and I appreciate, I appreciate the intention to remove the cast barriers, and for our riders and for the public transit. And however, right now, the what I heard over and over, and during my visit to neighborhoods, and the public safety, including public transit safety is a big concern for our readers. And this big concern is still in place. How could we and provide that option to open the door and for the riders under 12, 12 years old to go to our public transit and without any supervision and from parents and from adults. Uh, this is a big concern for me and I said, uh, however, I would like to say yes. Uh, I'm fully, strongly support our Edmontonians and readers and who need and use our public transit and then by moving the cost barriers. But in the current situation, in the current environment, I think our city, we need to focus on to resolve the public transit, including uh, all this type of safety concerns issues first and before we implement this policy change. Uh, so at that moment, I will support, but at this time, and with all the concerns in place, I will not support this policy change for the part one. Thank you, thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Knack? Uh, thanks, I was just, uh, one question on the amendment. Um, while the due date does say quarter two, is it possible to be clear that it would come at or before the spring supplemental uh, budget adjustment just to not lose out on that opportunity if there's a cost I guess to administration first which is quarter two but just a little more specific yeah absolutely counselor we can we can do that awesome if, if uh, so I, I'll either make that as an amendment or if it's deemed friendly just to make that clear instead of leaving it broad as quarter two, be a little more specific I think that's very friendly and we'll get that updated wording reflected okay then there's no further questions for me on the amendment thank you did you want to speak at all I guess I would, call it, well, I don't on need to main. speak on the amendment. Okay. I can speak on the main one if necessary. Thank you. Sounds good. Councillor Rutherford? I'm just on the board for the main, speak to the main. Great. And Councillor Paquette? Yeah. For the main. Great. So let's vote on the amendment, please. We're just getting it loaded.
I'll vote verbally as yes. Thank you, Councillor Knack. We have all the votes. Please display the votes. That's carried. Uh, do I need a motion to extend orders? If it will be um, five minutes or less, we don't. We can go with unanimous consent. Great. I yeah. will look for unanimous consent uh, and also look to my colleagues to be very uh, efficient and succinct in their comments. Thank you. Uh, I will go first to Councillor. Oh, Councillor Knapp will close on the main motion. So I will go to Councillor Rutherford. Yes, thanks. And no, nothing like a time pressure, uh, Madam Chair. Um, so if the I will absolutely be supporting both parts of these motions. I know I had a lot of hard questions on part one, but I think the clarity around what is already allowed in practice and this change is really just removing that financial barrier. And as was highlighted, we the sooner we can get people using transit, the younger they are, the more likely they are to, to choose transit when they're older. And so this is that long-term goal that we're looking for. And so I think that that is a great uh, policy change. And I know there will be budgetary impacts. So again, looking forward to the fact that we can still look at that in the totality of the bigger budget discussion. But um, my questions were answered and my concerns were, were eased on part one. So I will be supporting that in terms of part two. Again, I, I you know, ask some hard questions to our speakers that came here today. And I think that this change with it being a pilot, with it being a little bit more inclusive to looking at youth using transit and to access recreation more broadly is also very enticing to me. So with that, I will support both uh, parts of the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Uh, Councillor Paquette. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, this was something, uh, um, that was contemplated a few years ago um, when we first brought in the uh, you know uh, youth under 12 uh, could ride for free with a with a um, fair paying adult uh, at, at the time the conversation was uh, we were going to try it out the idea that uh, it would become free for for youth uh, was in contemplation already here's the reason why um, we're inventing sort of this boogeyman that like so if we do this suddenly there's going to be five-year-olds or seven-year-olds hopping on the bus and uh oh my gosh because there's no uh fee barrier what's the nightmare scenario that's going to result but we already have youth who try to get on the bus we already have the systems in place as people have have already addressed today um that nothing will change not one thing will change, but one thing will change. And that is that the, the deep concern I have then, and I still have now, is that um, for low-income families, uh, you're going to have a sibling who's in grade six, who's maybe 11 years old, who wants to go with their sibling in grade five, who's maybe 10 years old. And neither of them could get on the bus without paying a fare because they wouldn't have an adult paying a fare with them. And so it was an unequal and uh, unequitable distribution of a policy. What this does is it corrects that uh, unequal distribution. And so we can't, okay. We already have these systems in place for youth. This is not a move that makes youth unsafe. This is a, a move that actually makes youth safer uh, because now they can actually use the bus together as siblings or as friends rather than um traveling without any adult supervision whatsoever and so uh you know by not even being able to take the bus and having a longer commute home so this makes a, a, a big and powerful difference and I, I i know that it's easy to make your mind up but part of the idea of these closing statements isn't to uh, get on a uh, on a soapbox is to it's a last ditch effort at uh providing information and persuasion. And uh, we should always be approaching our jobs with open minds, with a willingness to be persuaded. So I hope that helps a little bit. Um, as for the, uh, and I'll just leave it at that. Uh, thank you. 
And Thank it looks like you're voting on two different things, so, but you know, I'm good. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Councillor Paquette. Uh, Councillor Knack to close. Yes, thank you. I, I won't repeat what uh, Councillor Paquette and Rutherford both shared, uh, but I'll, I'll offer just a few quick uh, pieces. First, on the free play thing, I, I want to thank Mr. Adams for all his work, and and uh, um, very excited about seeing how we can continue that forward. And I think the amendments that were made by uh, committee members were great additions to that. Uh, so hopefully, we can get that moving quick. And I, I didn't want to be too uh, picky about the use of pilot. My my hope is that actually we, we might not consider a pilot, but actually something permanent, uh, if only because a number of these organizations, as, as we all know, um, there's that ongoing struggle with, with nonprofits when if the um, funding isn't guaranteed, it's hard for them to plan in the long term. So, uh, but uh, we need to get moving on that. So, so that's a good start uh, in the right direction. Uh, finally, on the other pieces, uh, I think the only other thing I'll add, because I think it was uh, noted both by Councillor Rutherford and Councillor Paquette, that um, you know children under 12 can already use uh, for any parents who would feel uncomfortable with their child 12 and under using the system without them. This doesn't force them to do that. To be clear, right? This this just all we're talking about here is whether we should require them to pay. And having seen that this is now a movement. Uh, I, I wish we could be the first, but we're not the first uh, across Canada of providing that opportunity and knowing how, based off other examples, how little this actually costs to do and yet can have substantial impacts in making sure uh, children can access not just you know, school, but maybe the libraries or maybe recreation spaces, um, especially if you're in a family where uh, income is a challenge. We want to make sure those options are available for youth to access that. And so all this would say is that that small amount that we might be making today, let's get rid of that. Let's make get, that that is so small in the overall budget, if almost anything, that uh, let's let's help more youth access more things and uh, and then ideally build up that potential for future ridership uh, and, and continued ridership as they age. So uh, very excited about this. I uh, hope uh, to get support and look forward to the next steps. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I'll call the vote on this first motion, first part of the motion. And I'll vote verbally yes. Thank you, Councillor Knock. We have all the votes. Please display the votes. That's carried, uh, and uh, for part two of the motion, uh, please vote. Again, I'll vote verbally yes. Thank you, Councillor Knack, and we have all the votes. Please display the votes. And that's carried. Thank you so much to everyone for the work. We are now in recess until 1.30, where we'll be starting up with item 7.8. Thank you, everyone, for uh, your flexibility on the timelines today.
Wonderful. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are back in session for our executive committee meeting. I'll start with the roll call of committee members. Councillor Rice. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Councillor Rutherford. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And Councillor Knack. Bon après-midi. Oh, are you somewhere French? <laughs> Just wrapping up our CUTA conference oh. on Montreal. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, we're also joined by Councillor Salvador. Hello. And um, Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. Councillor Principe. Hello. And Councillor Tang. Hello. And Councillor Cartmel as well. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. So we will start uh, on item 7.8, and I believe administration has a presentation for us. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, with me today is Tara Ward and Chris Haywood, and I'm going to turn it over to Tara, who's got a short presentation for you. Thank you. Um, next slide, please. So um, I'm here to speak to the census policy review that was completed this year by administration. Um, and just to give a bit of background and the timeline of the census service, um, since uh, its uh, initiation in 1878, the, the city of Edmonton has conducted 87 um, municipal census projects. And Alberta is a unique jurisdiction in that it enables a municipal census. Um, and with those 87 different municipal census projects, the last one was completed in 2019, but it should be clear that between 1878 and 2019, the frequency of the, the census service uh, was a, a bit inconsistent, so it wasn't necessarily every year or every two years. It ranged a little bit in that time. In 2018, there was a program service review conducted, um, and there were eight recommendations that came out of that review. Um, the main recommendation was to continue with the census service because of the connection to um, the population count that was reported to the province as part of their grant alloc allocation um, process. It was also because of how municipal census data is used by um, project infrastructure or to project project infrastructure and service needs and its uh, application to long-term uh, land use planning. Um, and at that time, a council did uh, adopt a, a census policy and there was a census conducted in 2019. Um, however, at the end of 2019, council discontinued the census service due to desire to reduce operating the, op the overall operating budget and to changes at the provincial level with regards to its grant allocation. Um, at that time, the province uh, began discussions of repealing the determination of the uh, determination of population regulation, and the determination of population regulation is within the census regulation, um, and it was used to allocate per capita grants uh, prior to its repeal, which came into effect in 2020. In 2022, administration conducted a review of the census policy. Uh, there were two main drivers for this review. The wording of the current policy specifically references 2019 and 2020 census projects and is now out of date, and potential changes to the municipal census regulation, which may reinstate the de determination of population uh, regulation as part of the province's per capita funding formula. Next slide, please. Uh, the census review uh, was largely based um, on building an understanding of how the census service has been used across the organization and the potential implications of its discontinuation. This involved engaging with service users from both within the corporation as well as external partners. Internal stakeholders were in engaged in, in two different tiers. Primary service users are those who rely on municipal census data as part of their core business function. These include the corporate economist, sections of urban planning and economy, as well as branches in community services. Secondary service users apply municipal census data either circumstantially as part of their typical work or as part of ad hoc projects. These include branches of all departments. External partners were identified by their level of involvement in past census projects and the request to access customized data sets. Service user engagement allows us, allowed us to identify ways that uh, process and outputs have adapted across the corporation in the absence of the census service and whether gaps have emerged following its discontinuation. We also created budget scenarios that could be applied to different census project frequencies for committee's consideration. To support council's decision making, we have summarized how the organization has historically made use of municipal census data. 
Uh, service users uh, told us that municipal census data does have a number of important applications uh, as shown on the slide. So primary and secondary users, oh, next slide, sorry. I didn't see that, I, I apologize. Um, uh, principally, it's uh, used uh, to support uh, growth projections in a, key, a number of key areas, including economic forecasting, projecting housing demand and infrastructure and transportation needs. Municipal census data also provides a means to validate projections and assumptions, assumptions that are derived from the federal census data. And the population count extracted from the municipal census could be used by the province to allocate per capita grants should the regulation be reinstated. Uh, finally, the data strengthens elections on legislative projects, uh, operational planning for legislative projects such as uh, the elections, by-elections, and ward boundary reviews. While there is a potential value add, the Municipal Census Service does have some limitations. There can be discrepancies between Municipal Census population counts, the Government of Alberta's Provincial Population Estimate, and Federal Census data. These discrepancies emerge due to the different data collection methodologies, methodologies that are employed. Municipally, um, these uh, methodologies are set by the province under the, the census regulation, which mandates how data must be gathered and reported in a manner that doesn't often align with the federal census process. This can make it difficult to accurately assess the assumption and projections derived from the federal census, um, and public participation in the municipal census is discretionary, which creates some challenges in terms of response rates. Uh, the Government of Alberta has not made a decision whether or not to reinstate the determination of population regulation, and there is no timeline provided at this time uh, for when that decision would be made. Next slide. Next slide, please. Oh, one back, sorry. Um, uh, so through the, the review, uh, we identified a series of decision points for Council um, as part of, uh, a part of this process. Firstly, Council would need to determine whether to update the Census policy to establish a project frequency, thereby reinstating the Census service, or pause or repeal the policy and then extend the service's hiatus. If the policy were to be updated, a project schedule would need to be determined, as shown in decision point two. Two viable options uh, were identified, a biennial census project, so one that occurs every two years, or one that occurs with a four-year frequency in between federal census projects. A biennial schedule is the preference of primary service users within the organization and is also the frequency recommended in the PSR report from 2018. Next slide. Currently, administration recommends repealing policy C520C and discontinuing the municipal census service. While there is potential for value add, the limitation presented uh, by provincially mandated data collection methods and reporting requirements mean that the information from the municipal census is typically used as a secondary layer, um, input layer, and the government of Alberta has not indicated that these uh, processes or methodologies will change, even in the recent consultations. Internal processes have adapted since 2019 when the last municipal census was conducted. The federal census continues to be the primary input for economic growth forecasting and other population projections. Um, and currently there is no existing financial provision for the census service. A currently unfunded uh, service package would be required to support the project, which typically takes about two years to develop and deliver. Um, and this service package would include everything from personnel to a data management solution, as well as uh, public engagement um, uh, and, and maintaining the hardware are required to collect data, census data, particularly door to door. The projected cost of each census project would be about uh, 4.7 million and this includes about 320,000 for um, mobile devices for that door to door collection. Um, and if the, the project were to be uh, set at a two-year uh, frequency, it would be a, basically a 4.7 million uh, cost for each uh, census project. If the census policy was repealed, uh, the, the outcome would be that the provincial population estimates would be used to determine the city's per capita grant allegation, or, uh, allocation, regardless of whether the determination of population regulation is reinstated. Next slide. Thank you. And just uh, if, if in case you have any questions, we do still have our colleagues from UPE Legal Services as well as the Chief Economist here, and we're happy to take any questions that you might have. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, Councillor Rutherford, I believe you selected this, so happy to go to you for questions first. 
Yeah, and again, I'll just keep with the pace we're going at today and put the motion on the floor right off the hop. So I would like to move that executive committee recommend to city council that city policy C520C census policy be paused. Thank you. We'll just pull that up on the board, um, but happy to have you um, offer a bit of an introduction to that as the wording comes up. Yeah, so I know that the options were, were presented to us. I felt that a repeal uh, was a bit concerning to me, knowing as somebody that's worked in social planning, how the census data, while secondary, does really augment the, the work and the context um, and provide a touch point between the federal census data and projections. So I do think it does really add value. That being said, I know that there's no budget right now for it, but I know that the province has also considered things like the education tax going to municipalities. And I'd like to have the opportunity, if that is the case, to explore the census being a part of that, given that Edmonton Public and Edmonton Catholic are big stakeholders that use the census data as an example. And so I wouldn't have an indefinite pause. I would want to maybe reevaluate in a year's time, but I do think that a pause is more prudent um, because once a policy is gone, it takes a lot of effort to get it back. Pausing it uh, to me is, is a good balanced approach. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Um, so happy to take questions on the motion or on the report itself. Uh, so Councillor Rice, you're up next. Sorry, sorry to point of Sorry, I just have a couple questions still too. Oh, I apologize. I apologize, <laughs> Councillor Rutherford. Back to you for questions. Sorry, apologize, Councillor Rice. Um, yeah, just one real question. In the GBA, I'm going hard into GBA plus analysis is the, today because I'm finding they're they're lacking a little bit. In the GBA plus analysis, what I saw was missing was. Um, you know, GBA plus analysis at its core requires data to do the analysis. So by removing even an imperfect data point, are we not potentially creating challenges in how we do our GBA plus analysis as, as a whole as a city? Thank you, Councillor Rutherford, for the question. And I'll start and I'll maybe ask uh, Tara to jump in here. So I think what we were, when we were trying to evaluate what we would recommend to committee, it was really not just looking at one particular data point. I wanna just friendly reminder that it's not typical that council or, or um, the committee are the ones that set the census questions. And so um, as Tara has described, there have been a variety of different approaches used to the census. This is one of the things that we did look at and just on balance based on the enormous pressures that um, there is currently facing the current operating budget as well as previous council decisions to uh, remove the funding towards the census. We, that's why we recommended not pursuing this at this time and I'll just I'll pass it over to Tara to supplement. Thank you. Um, just to add, the, the core census questions are quite specific, um, and we have learned that the more questions we ask, the lower the response rate. Um, so the core questions for the census are the number of residents per dwelling, um, their age and their gender, which is a source of, of some data, but wider questions beyond that, you start to see, and I believe it's in one of your um, uh, appendices to the report, you start to see the reduction of the response rate as we get into kind of more detailed questions, which we would all like answers to, but but people seem to be a bit hesitant to provide that information. Yeah, no, no, that's fair. I appreciate that response. That was my only question. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford, and apologies again for, for cutting you short before. Uh, over to Councillor Rice now. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the report as well. Um, so can you get a sense like how big the gap and the between our municipal uh, census data uh, and federal and provincial census data. Which particular data point are you referring to? Uh, so I specifically I would like to look at is there any data gap and between the three levels um, of government is census data and so that could reflect on the data set and how we collect the data, what questions, and then for the type of data we collected. 
is there any big, how big that gap could be? Or is there very similar? We c collect the similar data. They're all three censuses are very, very, very different. Very different. Very different. Okay. That's, that's his actually answer my questions. Very different. So can you specifically uh, describe what the difference, what's a key difference? So I, I think it's not just the data sets, Councillor. Um, so one thing that we mentioned in the report is the response uh, requirement. So for the federal census, it's actually required that you respond to that census, so it does increase the response rates. For the municipal uh, census, the data collection is really um, in general voluntary and we have a way to deal with the core question which is the population count so the number of residents per per dwelling if we're not able to make that contact there is a methodology approved by the province to deal with that um, but i think that the, that is one of the the gaps so, in the data and then i would maybe i would maybe ask some of our colleagues um, from urban planning and economy that engage with the federal census data a bit more to speak to the differences and or um, the corporate economists that are also on so I think that answer is enough for me. It's good enough for me. And then I, I just want to um, follow up. So what is the cost, what's the cost, the specific cost for us, a municipal level to do this census? So we currently have a, a, a budget projection of 4.7 million per census project. And as I said before, that includes for uh, the general project personnel, but also the census workers, the ones that go to door to door, as well as a unique data management solution that enables online collection, which is something we've enabled in recent years, as well as um, uh, the, the door to door immediate collection and data validation. Okay, so, so it's 4.7 million per project. So my feel second, is that possible if we don't do our own census, we can use the federal or provincial census data? We can use the federal census data and the province doesn't collect a census, but they do population projections. So we still have data we can use and from federal. Okay. Yes. Thank you. I would just invite our colleagues from UPE and the um, chief economist who act. We're while the clerk's office have the privilege of collecting the data. Um, we use it for a very particular purpose. But I do know our colleagues in the corporation do use the municipal census for a much broader use, and would invite them to supplement so, our answer. Okay. Well, and, so and my time. No, that's okay. I I will I will use my time now and invite uh, and invite mm -hmm. those comments um, if if anyone wanted to jump on there. I'll go ahead, Emily Hurd from uh, UPE. Um, so as uh, acknowledged, our use of the municipal census is quite particular. Um, it is one of the few sources that um, we can get at information below the um, neighborhood level, specific to the question of um, the federal census. Um, I think it's the difference between the amount of time between census um, in our applications. So the difference between the five year and uh, a more frequent um, uh, collection of information. Um, let me know if that's answered your question. Yes, thank you. That was helpful, helpful insight. Uh, so maybe, you know, I had understood the 4.7 million cost as being sort of per budget cycle, but, but it could actually be eight or almost nine, over nine million, I guess, per, per budget cycle. Yeah, that's that's correct. Um, the census is it's uh, a unique project, and so even with the data management solution that we need to procure, it's not a one-time investment. It's a it's basically a subscription service. You pay for it each year you're using it, and for each project, and you basically have to r do some of the basic change and um, maintenance work continuously. And the same with the the um, hardware that's required to go to door to door, we have to replace that regularly, so that's a significant cost, and a large portion of the costs are paying census workers to do that work. Okay, well thank you. Uh, I did just want to get administration's perspective on, uh, you know, the, the benefits and, and drawbacks of, of pausing versus repealing. Any, any thoughts you could offer in terms of the implications or um, I appreciate Councillor Rutherford's intent to, you know, again, once something's gone, it might be harder to bring back, but just open to your thoughts on that. 
we've had this conversation um, since I'd say almost now three years. Um, as part of the program and service review work, I was actually part of the challenge panel that was set up with external members of the community who were actually looking at should this policy continue and should the city be doing census, census work. This was long before the changes were contemplated at the province. Um, there is real value to doing a census, um, but I think our recommendation is based on the current circumstances that we find ourselves in, and that's why we recommended what we did. But again, this is a policy that belongs to council, and we're happy to take your direction on this. And if, recognizing that it's a decision, uh, you know, really grounded on current conditions, if conditions change, uh, you know, in the, in the medium term, again, is it easier to come forward with a brand new policy or would it be easier to just unpause uh, the existing policy? From my experience, it's always easier to unstick something that still exists than to start from scratch. I think one of the reasons that um, I, we definitely push to come forward with a concrete recommendation is that uh, the municipal election is but three years away and with uh, with one more year of sort of pre-planning work once we're two years ago two years away we are into the election planning it's extremely difficult and highly not recommended to be running an election and a census in the same year ah. and so that's why um, always love clear direction so that we don't find ourselves in a year's time in exactly the same situation which if council would find themselves in a different financial situation next year at the end of 2023, giving us money to run a census puts us firmly in the spring of 2025, <laughs> and I do not recommend we do a census that year. Great. Well, that's that's really helpful insight, and I think um, would there be would you if we did move a pause rather than a repeal? I know Councillor Rutherford mentioned the potential of sort of revisiting the decision in the future. Would you would it provide? assurance if we added some clear parameters in the pause so pause and then to be revisited yeah i would say completely fair to pause it and let's see what happens with the provincial regulation i mean we think we know what was going to happen but we don't know so anytime there's a change in regulations we're always hap happy to come back and have a check-in with council the policy's on the books right now but we're not following it because we didn't do a, poli a census in 2019 and with covid in 2020 and the funding being removed, we lost the ability. The policy still stands, but without the budget, we can't fulfill those, those policy obligations. Okay, well, thank you very much. So, so it seems to me that the motion on the floor, <clears throat> you know, achieves, achieves the outcome that we want in terms of clarity of not doing a census. It provides flexibility for coming back to it in the future, um, recognizing that we need to, to mind ourselves in terms of when we may ask you to revisit that. Okay, well, thank you so much for that clarity. Uh, Councillor Tang, I see that you're on the board. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and I actually appreciate this motion because it flagged some stuff I had questions about as well. Um, and uh, just on that thread of uh, GBA plus, um, so I, I take your point about, you know, you don't want to overload the question bank because it discourages participation. Uh, but do we ever go down that route of, say, disaggregating data with our census tool? Councillor, we have asked a range of questions. And so, like I said, the, the core questions are around the number of residents per dwelling, age, and gender. Um, and we have in the past asked, uh, uh, I think pretty particularly 2016, we asked quite detailed questions. But again, um, the further you get down that question list, the fewer responses yeah. you get. Um, and so that's kind of the challenge. Yeah, and uh, can you remind me what the particip participation rate is for our census for the last few times we've done it? So it actually ranges per question, Councillor, and I believe that's oh, one of the appendices to the report. And I apologize, I don't have it in front of me, but you can see as you get down further in the questions, it reduces. So our pure population count, we are required by the province to have a 95% re response it's rate. Yeah. Um, uh, but for the other questions that fall outside of that, it's it's not required. And there is a methodology to, to deal with if we don't have response, direct response, there's a neighbor to neighbor response for that population count, but that can't be used for the other questions. Right. Um, and then I was wondering too, just about the value add, I mean, um, just all the things that you are, you've already mentioned, but I also wonder, you know, with municipal census, we, we do get to control the questions we ask versus on relying on other Question years developed by other public services, um, and I was wondering, 
you know, was that taken into consideration too when evaluating value add and limitations? I would say going back to the program and service review, that was actually one of the key conversation points during um, the external evaluations, the challenge panels, is this is something that the municipalities do get to control very much. But again, this is only one um, data point, and so there is a lot of other um, data gathering initiatives that do go on across across the city. It's just there's a lot more rigor to this. In 2016, um, I believe the questions were a lot more detailed. When we looked at a corporation as the options for the next census, I, I do believe there was an internal working group came, uh, that was created and I think we got the short list down to 50 questions because anytime you go out and talk to the public, it's such a great rich experience that a lot of departments and branches, we all wanted to get little pieces of information. But again, in working with the clerk's office at the time, we really needed to balance what was actually attainable and achievable and trying to keep the response rates up. So it's definitely more of an art than a science in this regard. Yeah. Yeah, no, this was very interesting. I, you know, I definitely support municipalities having more control over, over some of these practices um, and not always rely on deduction. Uh, uh, and I, I actually think your recommendations are, are quite sound and uh, just even with a pause, I guess, to the mover, I know you had mentioned maybe reevaluate in like a year or so, kind of given the, given what administration had mentioned with the current budget situation um, and, you know, also the, the municipal election. Uh, and we don't want to have two things going on at the same time that are a huge, massive undertaking. Um, I guess I was wondering, well, can we pause indefinitely until situations changes? Is that... I don't know. What do you think about that? Yeah, I, I think my I hear I hear the city clerk and not wanting that overlap. And and I agree. I think, you know, but I also know as somebody that's written policy for municipalities, how challenging it is once a policy is gone to bring it back. And like uh, the the city clerk said, it's way easier to, you know, bring back a paused policy or to to reference a paused policy than a than one that has been removed. Yeah, and I'm not saying that 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 we repeal. I'm saying we're no pause with that parameter of like just indefinitely until some circumstances change. Um, yeah, anyway, I mean, I would also, I would also, you know, I I would challenge also the biannually because I think that it's really the gap we're trying to fill is between the two federal censuses. So. In the future, I think we need to look at whether it could be, for example, just always two years after the federal census, as mm -hmm. an example, just once. Um, so I think there's other things that we can look at, but I feel like I need time to talk to stakeholders. I need time to, to, to really see how this is used and see what it looks like without it, and if there are information gaps that that arise. So I feel like pausing is that prudent midstep. Yeah. Definitely have no intent to make our city clerks do a census in the middle of a, an election. Yeah, and I will hate for them to prepare a report for it as well as they kind of gear up for the election. Uh, so anyways, appreciate, appreciate the report and the conversation. Well, thank you, thanks so much. Uh, I don't see anyone else on the board. Um, so assuming that that means there are no further questions, I uh, am happy to move to speaking. Uh, Councillor Rutherford, I will note you to close. Is there anyone else that wished to speak to this motion? No, I'm not seeing. Um, maybe I'll just briefly add, uh, yeah, thank you so much for the work that has gone into this. Thank you to the um, mover of the motion. I really appreciated the idea that uh, you know, having a midpoint census between federal census, there are different ways we can look at this, uh, but I, I like the direction now to, to take a pause. Um, and, uh, and revisit this down the road past the next uh, municipal election. So thank you so much again, and thanks to the mover for bringing this forward. I look forward to supporting it. Uh, and over to you, Councilor Rutherford, to close. Yeah, I think my closing will be simple. I think this report, like many of the reports that come before Council, was really well done. I thought there was a very good balance between the pros and the cons of a census. And, uh, you know, my theory and philosophy is though that in more information, even if it's imperfect, because all information is ultimately imperfect, uh, has limitations, uh, is still better than none. And I just feel like, as mentioned in my introduction, this is a fair way to make sure, you know, we're not putting operational pr budgetary pressures on ourselves. We're not, um, 
you know, also on the other extreme, throwing throwing everything away when really we can use this time to see whether there is that gap in information that a census could fill. Because as Councillor Tang pointed out, it's the one area that we can really control what and how and at the neighborhood more micro level as well. So I think there's it's worth just pausing at this point and I'd appreciate the, the support for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, please vote. I'm a yes. Thank you, Councillor Knack. We have all the votes. Please display the votes. And that's carried. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, that finishes our public reports for today. So I will move that we now go into private uh, for items 9.1 and 9.2. Um, does that, yeah, we don't have any other in public, in public business that we need to complete, so I will make that motion and ask my colleagues to vote, please. I'm a yes. We have all the votes. Please display the votes. And that's carried. Thank you. We'll take a brief recess as we get... Uh,
know if anyone can respond. I know I'm getting uh, Hi, questions. Andrew. Oh. We can hear you. You're just very quiet. Okay. I'll speak up. There you go. We can hear you now. Thank you. Okay, we are live in public from River Valley Room. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna turn to Councillor Rice to move a motion on item 9.1. Let me find the wording here provided by administration. So I move that October 26, 2022, integrate infrastructure services verbal reports IIS 01535 be received for information. That October 26, 2022 integrated infrastructure services verbal report, uh, IIS 01535 remain pers private pursuant to section 24, 25 and 27 of the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Um, unless anyone would like to speak, I'll, I'll call for the vote, please. I'm a yes. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor Knack. We have all the votes. Please display the votes. And that's carried, thank you. Um, I'll go back to Councillor Rice for a motion on item 9.2, please. So I'm waiting for the wording here, uh, 9.2. As uh, the chat is 9.2 9 point, 9 right now. That's, do I, do I need to read all of them? Because it's one, two, three, four, five, very long. So I just start that. Uh, I move that attachment one of the October 26, 2022 Office of the 30 Kirk Report OCC01436 be received to reflect the in private discussion on October 26, 2022. That the October 26, 2022 Office of the City Clerk Report OCC01436 and that revised attachment one of the October 26, 2022 Office of the City Clerk reports OCC01346 remaining private pursuit to section to section 17 and 24 of the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. I move that attachment 14 be added to to the October 26, 2022 Office of the City Clerk report OCC01436 to refract the private discussion on October 26, 2022, and that the actions in atta attachment 14 be approved, and the attachment 14 remain private pursuit to sections 17 and 24 of the Freedom of Information and the Protection of Privacy Act. I move that the Executive Committee recommend to City Council that the individuals named in revised attachment one of the October 26, 2022 Office of the City Clerk Report OCC01436 be appointed to the GEF Center's Housing Board for the term of upon appointment to April 30, 2025. Thank you, Councillor Rex. That was quite the motion. I appreciate you reading that in for us. Um, uh, and seeing no one online to speak, I will call the vote. I'm a yes. Thank you, Councillor Knack. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that's carried. Um, wonderful. Well, that concludes uh, most of our business for today. I am not aware of any motions pending or notices of motion or motions without customary notice. Give a pause there. Wonderful. We are now adjourned. Thank you to our team for getting us through today. And thanks uh, to all my colleagues. Have a great evening.